We're speaking this evening about the record of the rocks. As someone told me, for a fellow who has rocks in his head, this is a very appropriate subject. Uh, I plead guilty to that. I enjoy talking about the rocks. They do provide a challenge, at least in terms of the way they're typically presented. If you watch the education channels, public TV, uh, you look in the earth science textbooks, you'll see evidence from the rocks representing that which flatly contradicts what we read in the Bible. When we look at the rocks, we're talking about not just all rocks, but the record that we have reference to involves the sedimentary rocks. That's rocks laid down by water. And if you have studied earth science, know just a little bit about geology, you understand that there is an average of about a mile and a half of sedimentary rock that covers the continents. That's rocks laid down by water. Now in those rocks, there are billions and billions of dead things that are fossils. Now when you have billions and billions of dead things and rocks laid down by water all over the world, uh, I think you've got a pretty strong argument for catastrophic judgment. But of course the evolutionist tells us this was accomplished by a slow gradual buildup over millions of years. And as we saw last night, I think it's accomplished by a rapid year-long series of catastrophes that it could not be slow, and the evidence for slow uh, is not there. But the evolutionary representation of this record of the rocks looks like this. This is in all the biology textbooks, all the earth science textbooks. And we're told that as you go further down in the rocks, you find these simple animals. And as you come up nor near the top, they get more complex. And then the modern animals near the top, which shows an evolutionary progression. And the record of the rocks has recorded like a tape recorder, the evolution of life through time. That's their interpretation of what we're seeing. The biggest problem with this representation is rather obvious, and that is that you can't go out and look in the rocks and find it anywhere. It exists in the textbooks, but it does not exist anywhere on the face of the earth, that is, in the complete form that you see in the textbooks. Now, if that sounds like a rather brash statement, notice the, uh, the quote from Leet and Judson, one of the typical textbooks used as a geology text in our universities. Because we cannot find sedimentary rock representing all of earth time neatly in one convenient area, we must piece together the rock sequence from locality to locality. This process of tying one rock sequence in one place to another in some other place is known as correlation. And so instead of digging down and finding it in any one place, you find some over here and find some over there, and you tie it together and correlate it, correlate the layers, not based on what you see in any one place. As the Encyclopedia Britannica says, the end product of correlation is a mental abstraction called the geologic column. Now, you don't get that impression in the undergraduate earth science textbooks. That's a shame, but this is not concrete, if you please. Uh, it is a mental abstraction that is built together. Well, how do you build it? How do you know when you correlate whether this rock goes down or up? Well, if you're an evolutionist and you have rocks with simple animals, where do they go? They go on the bottom. I'm somewhat oversimplifying, but that's a general picture of what's happening. R.H. Rastel in the Encyclopedia Britannica puts it this way. It cannot be denied that geologists are here arguing in a circle. The succession of organisms has been determined by a study of their remains embedded in the rocks. And the relative ages of the rocks are determined by the organisms they contain. Now, let me illustrate and simplify, somewhat oversimplifying, but still 
uh, not misrepresenting, a person says, we have a primitive fossil here. Okay, how do you know? And of course, that would go on the bottom of the column. But how do you know that's a primitive fossil? Well, it's found in an old rock. All right, that would make sense. Uh, if you've got an old rock, it'd be a primitive fossil. But now, how do you know that this is an old rock? Well, it's got a primitive fossil in it. And this is obviously not proving anything. But that is how this column in its complete form is built. You don't determine the kind of rock it is by the kind of rock it is, but by the critters that you find in it, the dead things in the rock, and uh, how primitive you think they are. There are a number of other problems with it as well. For one thing, as we look at this column, we see mostly animals with backbones, or the vertebrates. Relatively speaking, they just uh, virtually don't exist in the fossil record. It's mainly clams, clams and more clams, uh, at least proportionately. It's skewed, obviously, to the more impressive, larger animals, whereas at least 95% of the entire fossil record is composed of marine invertebrates. But you virtually see none of those in the geologic column. Of the 5% that's left, 4.5% are plants and algae. And we hadn't gotten to the vertebrates yet, which are mostly what you see represented in the column. The vertebrates are about one one hundredth of one percent. Not one percent. <laughs> one one hundredth of a percent. That's just virtually not there. Most of it's, well, why don't you then represent it with marine invertebrates? Somebody might get the impression this is a marine deposit or maybe a flood deposit, which was the impression of the founders of the discipline of geology. They all thought that because I think that's what it clearly indicates for reasons we'll be looking at. The father of modern stratigraphy, Nicholas Stino, is touted as a hero today in all the geology textbooks. Dot and Batten's evolution of the earth says besides correctly interpreting fossils, the result was the formulation of the most basic principles for analysis of earth history. Steno showed great insight, and he, he's the one that started it, and his rules are the ones you have to memorize in order to pass stratigraphy today. Steno's axioms provide the ultimate basis of practically all interpretation of earth history, so their importance can hardly be overemphasized. I had one geology professor interrupt a presentation I was making down at Lamar University. We know all about Nicholas Stino. We have to memorize his 12 axioms, and she had to rattle them off right in the middle of the presentation. Said, well, I'm glad that you know about him and understand Nicholas Stino, but do you know how he thought this record came to be? Well, yes, he was an evolutionist. Well, <laughs> that's just not the case. Uh, his book was on display in Cambridge, where I was doing work there at Trinity College. And this is a picture of that book, and it's in the fly piece stating it's dedicated to the proof of the Noachan deluge. This is where he was coming from. In fact, it was revealed, uh, and it's just pretty much a revelation. Uh, last year in geology, that Steno believed in a universal flood throughout his life. This is how he explained it, and he understood it well enough to write the rules that you still have to memorize if you're going to pass stratigraphy. Now, people will say, well, this flood geology is a bunch of foolishness. It won't really explain what we see in geology. Is that so? <laughs> Nicholas Stino refutes that. This was his concept, and he was a pioneer who was a, a genius and... Uh, if you don't understand what he understands, uh, you can't do geology today. Building on his work, men like Whitcomb and Morris wrote the Genesis flood, compiling the evidence from geology together with what we know in Genesis and showing that this is the best explanation for what we see in the rock record. Interestingly, John C. McCampbell agreed to write the foreword to this book. He's an evolutionist. 
professor and head of the Department of Geology at the University of Southeastern Louisiana. And he says in that forward that the facts of geology do fit this explanation and that the authors make a very strong case for this explanation and present a serious challenge to the evolutionary interpretation. Now, he didn't say their view fits, our view doesn't, but he came pretty close, even though he's an evolutionist. It does fit. And so when people say, well, it's just no way that a flood can explain what we see in geology, well, they just don't know what they're talking about. But if you had a flood, wouldn't it just mix everything up? Not necessarily. You have floods that bury things basically where they are, transporting sometimes, but the general rule is things get buried where they live and not everything lives at the same place. Things that live at the bottom of the ocean would be buried in different places from things that live up here in Texas. And you see gradations even in the ocean. The Cambrian, the bottom lowest layer as defined by the evolutionist, is ocean bottom. Critters that lived on the bottom of the ocean, some of them very complex as we'll see. And the Ordovician lived a little higher. The Devonian still higher with some amphibians. And the worldwide flood would bury organisms where they lived, and I think we see that at least in a general way. And I'd underscore that because there's going to be some mixing. But in a general way, that would be reflected. And as we see and imagine the water rising, we would see different environments being buried. Now, they're not all together in one place, and you may have two or three of these in one place, but seldom more than that. But here, putting them together, it would leave a picture like this. And then when buried, uh, we can see that it would leave a deposit that would have some kind of an order. Here we see the kind of deposit that would segregate and separate the groups of animals and they would be buried separately not because they're separated by millions of years but because they live in different places and that's where they'd be buried. Now you don't have this kind of an ordered sequence. This is an arranged, skewed misrepresentation of what's actually there. It's a conceptual correlation that is useless as proof of evolution because it's based on the circular logic. But you do see a general order, I think, that reflects the ecology that we can observe today. I do think this representation, however, is useful as a model, as a representation of what ought to be if evolution is true. Now, we don't assume the thing to be true, build an illustration of it and say, see, it's proved. That's the circular logic. It's not proof. But it's a good model. It's an illustration of what ought to be if evolution is true. We have an alternative model, and then we compare that with the real world, with the facts, and that's how we test. We don't just holler and see who can say it's proved loudest. We look at the evidence, and we see which fits the facts best. How do you test this model against the facts? I think Stephen Stanley does a good job of describing how that test should proceed from Johns Hopkins University. He's a very famous geologist. And he says topsy-turvy fossils would test it. We'll look at a fuller description of that before we conclude tonight. But this idea of things that are supposed to be at the bottom on top or things supposed to be on the top on bottom, topsy-turvy fossils, would disprove evolution. Any topsy-turvy sequence of fossils would force us to rethink our theory. And so if you're finding things that are supposed to be on the bottom, up at the top, then you've got a problem. Well, you should have. The problem for the evolutionist is we find that kind of thing all the time. That's really not that unusual. They're called living fossils. Niles Eldridge wrote a book about that. He's the curator of the uh, American Museum of Natural History and professor at Columbia. He says there seems to have been almost no change in any part we can compare, that is, of these ancient fossils supposed to be down at the bottom that are found alive today. We've not completely solved the riddle of living fossils. That would be a topsy-turvy fossil, but there are so many and it's so common, they really just don't pay a whole lot of attention to it. They really won't 
the other kind of contradiction, as we'll see. But to give an illustration of what he's talking about with living fossils, maybe the most famous one is the coelacanth. A uh, beautiful fossil here of a rather strange looking fish, but one that we find rather commonly in the fossil record. Described here by Keith Thompson, who's president of the Academy of Natural Sciences, as a living fossil. Uh, he says in his book, a fish thought to be extinct for 70 million years, which is about the time the dinosaurs have been extinct. The fish was a coelacan, an animal that thrived concurrently with the dinosaurs. But from the point where they're supposed to have gone extinct, all the way up the column, you find no coelacans and virtually no dinosaurs. They look quite like the what? <laughs> the modern forms, yes, we have found them. Now, he says we have no fossil coelacans younger than the late Cretaceous. That's where the dinosaurs are supposed to have gone extinct. And so we've got plenty of them up to that point. From that point forward, nothing. But so far, we've caught about 600 of them out in the ocean since 1937 when we found the first one. But they were extinct at the same time, well, because we don't have them in the column. If they stop in the column and you don't have them above, I think that just means they didn't live at these places. They lived at these places. And the fact you don't find them up here doesn't mean that they're not still around somewhere. Notice the description here in the prehistoric atlas of what are called living fossils. And he says there are numerous organisms in present day fauna and flora which can be regarded as living fossils. One of the best known among them is Neopolina, the only living representative of a class of mollusks thought to have been extinct for 350 million years before 1957 when Neopolina was caught off the coast of Costa Rica. 350 million years of rock layers and you don't find anything, and plenty of them down below 150 million years according to the evolutionary interpretation, and they're alive. Well, now, their view is they're separated by 350 million years. They've been gone a long time. They just resurrected. Now, I think the interpretation is wrong. Another excellent example is the horseshoe crab. We're looking in the upper portion of a moder at a modern, modern horseshoe crab, which is very common. When I lived in Panama City, you could just see them all over the place out there. They were a, a nuisance. And here is the fossil down in the lower part that looks for all the world just like it. Keith Thompson describes this. He said the first members of this group appeared some 420, 24 million years ago in the Silurian and looked quite like modern forms. The last fossils became, became extinct about 50 million years ago. Uh, I'm sorry, fossils don't become extinct. They, <laughs> but I know what he means. Uh, we find them as fossils according to their interpretation, 50 million years ago, and nothing since then. And they're just all over the place. They're not even rare, to say the least. And there are hundreds of examples. Sometimes, when we know those things are happen and are common, they just you don't worry. The logic, though, falsifies the concept. There are so many of them, they just seem to get numb to that. But some of them really aggravate. How many know what we're looking at here? The little hacksaw blade critters are very important fossils, uh, especially for petroleum geologists. These are, are graptolites, and the various species allow you to identify a certain level. They lived, I think, at different temperatures and at different uh, environments in the ocean um, and allow petroleum geologists to, to order uh, their search. But notice the statement by Sue Rigby of the British Geological Survey, writing in Nature, all paleontologists dream of finding a living fossil, and uh, in reality, it would be a nightmare. But Noel Dilley, they say, it seems, has done so, as graptolites are arguably the most important zone fossils of the lower Paleozoic. In other words, when you find this one, that says 570 to 360 million years. That's the way you determine that layer. That's how you correlate when you find that, you know that's at least 360 million years ago. They found them alive. What are they doing alive? Doesn't that falsify the concept of extinction when they disappear in the column? 
I just think they lived there. They didn't live higher. And when the flood deposit buried them, they didn't live any higher and didn't get buried any higher. And so the fact that they're still alive doesn't surprise me a bit. It fits our view perfectly. It does not fit theirs. Notice the recent statement. This is just uh, about a year old in science. A bunch of sea urchins turned up in the Cretaceous like a big penny millions of years after they were believed to have been gone extinct. Their reappearance cast doubt on the existence of one long presumed mass extinction. Well, uh, <laughs> I can understand that. What, why did they think there was a mass extinction? Well, here were just tons of these things and they're gone and you don't find them anymore. And there they are again. Well, maybe they didn't go extinct after all. Does, is that hard to figure out? Fifteen of the 29 species apparently extinct genera reappeared. Another seven so much uh, like, uh, like them later appeared. Therefore, must not really have gone extinct. You think? <laughs> Isn't that pretty obvious? The idea of extinction when they disappear in the column is falsified over and over and over again, and it's in every textbook you can pick up on geology. They just repeat it over. It doesn't matter what the evidence is. The topsy-turvy fossils refute, but there's so many of them, they've just apparently become numb. We'll look at one more here at least one more. David Noble was out on a holiday hike and he stepped off the beaten path into the prehistoric age standing amid trees thought to have disappeared 150 million years ago. Puts him right in the middle of Jurassic Park. <laughs> the discovery is the equivalent of finding a small dinosaur still alive on the earth, said Carrick Chambers, director of the Botanical Garden. Wouldn't that be neat to find us? What's the difference? Not a bit. We do that all the time. And it wouldn't surprise me if we were to find a dinosaur still alive. What's the evidence that they're gone? Same evidence for the coelacanth. Same evidence for this tree. And so how do you know they won't find it? You don't know. There is good evidence that you don't know. That's the topsy fossils, the thing supposed to be at the bottom that you find at the top. Alan Turner refers to that and especially the implications regarding extinction uh, just, uh, what, in September of this year. Paleontologists really don't know the answer to that. You think some of, you, some of these quotations are maybe from five or six years ago and you're like, well, surely they've learned something since then. Well, this is pretty much up to date, I think, September 6, 2007. We don't know the answer to that. Why some animals survive extinction, others don't is one of the most difficult questions in paleontology and why you see this thing that's obviously extinct according to the column, but swimming around, they don't know. It does falsify the idea that because you don't find it above a certain point, it's extinct. And you have literally hundreds of examples of that. But the thing that really is a test in the mind of the evolutionist is the other kind of contradiction. What's supposed to be up found down, or what we'll call the turvy fossils, because if <laughs> the, the mammals had not got there yet and you find them down here at the bottom, then obviously you've got a real, real challenge. Richard Dawkins describes the implications. Uh, we've spoken about him several times this week. We should be very surprised, for example, to find humans appearing in the record before mammals are supposed to have evolved. If a single well-verified mammal skull were to turn up in 500 million year old rocks, our whole modern theory of evolution would be utterly destroyed. So he's got his chin out pretty far here. You, don't, you can't find this. And he's rather confident because if you do find it, then he's got answers for that too. For example, we have found that kind of thing rather commonly. One very obvious and dramatic example is near LaSalle, Utah, where perfectly modern human skeletons replaced with malachite are found in a layer that's also found at Dinosaur National Monument, one that is known for its dinosaurs in the Dakota Sandstone. Found back in the early 70s. 
here pictured by Lynn Ottinger, who did not find them, but he stumbled across them after they were uncovered by Dave Fuller a few days earlier, who had covered them back over, was waiting for officials to get there, and Lynn stumbled on them. But nevertheless, they're parts of two perfectly modern individuals, 50 feet down in the Dakota Sandstone, supposed to be 140 million years old. This is the same formation that we find at Dinosaur National Monument. Now, Dinosaur National Monument is a big monument, covers a lot of area. Where the visitor center is, we have the layer just below that, the Dakota Sandstone. But in many places throughout Dinosaur National Monument, you find outcrops of the Dakota Sandstone. And the Dakota Sandstone, as well as the Morrison, all are known for their dinosaurs. And both of them are well represented at Dinosaur National Monument. This is a, a map uh, put out for tourists in the Moab area, which is about 20 miles from this find, not the same area, but gives you some idea of the geology. And if you're familiar with Moab, you know it's right in the middle of a big fault. You see the Entrada Formation up here at the top. Here's the Entrada Formation down at the bottom over here. This fault slipped up. This, of course, was down here, and it slipped up. But here is the Dakota Sandstone. Here is the Morrison that we were looking at. And the bones that we're talking about here are in the Dakota. This would be about 140 million years ago, according to the evolutionary interpretation, right in the middle of the dinosaur period that became extinct 65 million. So 140 million is, is uh, certainly in the middle of that period. As we've suggested, I've made a number of trips to the site. This picture was taken just a few months ago with the present owner, Bill Harrison. It is an open pit copper mine, at, uh, or has been in the past. Bill is now uh, taking the azurite and malachite nodules from the site. This shows a wide area, and unfortunately, many people who go there don't back up and look at the broader geologic context. We can see the layers going all the way across here. And we're looking at three different levels in this picture. This excavation was done during the mining operation of the 30s. They got to very hard rock, which you can see here at the edge, the bottom extent of that excavation that was tearing up their bulldozers. And so they stopped, even though it was a very, very profitable copper mine at the time. Uh, in the 70s, they began again and came on down, and this excavation, the second level, is the result of the excavation in the 30s, taking it on down some 50 feet. Uh, the road level is still down further than that. Uh, that road was excavated in the 30s. And it was at this site, 50 feet down, that these human skeletons were found. Dave Fuller was driving the bulldozer. Actually, his father drove the bulldozer for the excavation back in the 30s. And uh, he, you know, at the time this picture was taken, was head of uh, San Juan County Roads. He's now retired. But he showed us where, when he was driving the bulldozer, he came across these bones. He said there were no broken layers that was completely undisturbed and he had taken it down some 15 feet from the point at which they had stopped in the 30s so that he was down a total uh, of about 50 feet at that point. Here with Bill Harrison he described in detail exactly what happened and uh, the entire context. Here is a profile, a side profile. We see the road cut. We were taking the picture from over here a moment ago. And uh, this is the way it looks at present. This is where the skeletons were found. Now this uh, was the, the original excavation. This was the excavation of the 70s. This is the road cut in the 30s. Now this is a picture from that perspective. We'll back up and see here's actually this portion of it that you'll be able to look at. We're not looking at the road cut in that picture. Here is the upper section. Uh, where the, uh, the 30s excavation was done. This is the 70s section here. So you can see the two-tiered effect, mining operation of the 30s and then of the 70s here from the side. And this is the way it looks in profile. Prior to the excavation of the 70s, and just months before the find, it looked like this. 
and there the skeletons were somewhere between 15 and 20 feet down from the surface of the 70s excavation and of course still further down from the uh, excavation of the 30s. Uh, 150 feet from the road cut. Typical of the Dakota sandstone are extremely hard sandstone layers and then semi-lithified layers. You can dig in it with a pocket knife. It's certainly much more than loose sand, but it's, and it's, it's rock and uh, certainly qualifies as that, but it's not extremely hard in between and they're alternating layers. And if you know anything about the Dakota sandstone throughout the area for hundreds of miles, that's typical of the Dakota sandstone, alternating hard and semi-lithified sandstone. Before 1930, when the road was cut, before they began the mining operation, this is the way it looked, and at that point, the skeletons are 50 feet down in the Dakota sandstone, 150 feet from the road cut. Prior to the road cut, it looked like this. And the road cut was formed, as we've suggested, in 1930. And you can see the continuing layers on the other side of the road picking up right where these layers left off. We acquired an aerial photograph of the area that was taken about the time of the road cut, just shortly afterwards. Here is the property owned by the mining company. This is the road that was cut in 1930. Prior to the time the road was cut, this hill just continued right across, but obviously the road bisected that. Uh, and then the mining operation began. We'll look at a close-up, and there we see the road and the property. The 30s excavation covered this area, and then the 70s went further down in this area as it approached the road. Uh, but prior to that excavation, that material, uh, and pr prior to the road cut, it was continuous all the way across. Radiocarbon dates of the bones have produced a variety of dates. 210 years, or UCLA carbon dates uh, in radiology, 1450 years was published in the Journal of Utah Archaeology. There's a wide range. There's a, a spring that percolates right down through the middle of this, leaching and adding material, and so we would expect a wide range and not accurate dates because material is continually being added and leached. And the bones are replaced in varying degrees with other minerals, and so that indicates things are being added and things are being taken away, which would uh, obviously not make for good radiocarbon dates. But if it's older than 1930, you see, that's the ball game. If it's older than 1930, it's 50 feet down with no access, unless you're going to go through these extremely hard layers, and that's not something somebody would do. You might tunnel through some of the side layers, but the tunnel at this point would have to come from at least 200 feet away. The bones themselves vary in the degree of replacement. Some of them are almost modern looking, as are many very old bones. Many dinosaur bones are fresh. Some of them are almost completely replaced, as is this bone. This bone had, I personally excavated, washed it off with a canteen. It had been out of the ground less than five minutes when I was holding it here and the picture was taken. It's a vibrant green. And from the flesh tones there, you can tell that that's, that's a pretty good rendition of the color of those bones replaced by a, a copper salt, uh, by malachite. Some of them are turquoise, which likewise is a salt associated, a, a, a copper salt associated with copper. And here is a jawbone that is just perfectly replaced, held by Joe Taylor, whom some of you know. The teeth are jewelry grade turquoise. Sorry, that's just <laughs> turquoise, perfectly replaced. I don't think that's a modern burial. And I think the more you look at that, the more obvious that is. And uh, I did mean to bring some of those bones. Unless I left it in the car, I didn't get here with them.
but I do have some of the bones that are available for you to examine, and it's hard replaced bone. This is the site, the particular spot, where the bulldozer uncovered the first finds, and then Lynn Ottinger stumbled across it days later. In, uh, toward the road, uh, down at the, the level that had been reached by the 70s excavation. This is a picture that was taken uh, at that time, back in the early 70s. Uh, pictures appeared uh, and uh, articles appeared in a number of magazines, I think, giving a fairly accurate rendition uh, of what had been found and of the obvious problems that were involved. Lynn Ottinger was the one that stumbled across this days later. He was leading a rockhound group, and they were collecting minerals, and they stumbled across these bones. <clears throat> and if he looks like he ought to have what me worry written across the bottom here, I, you have, uh, well, that, uh, I wouldn't disagree with that. But he called these bones the Moab man. He's a very unique, eccentric individual, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I don't think they should be called the Moab man for a number of reasons. First, this is Lynn Ottinger's term, and Lynn was not the discoverer. He had no right to the bones. It wasn't his property. The bones didn't belong to him, though he confiscated the bones and sold them for $10,000. They weren't his. Uh, a lot of people have been prosecuted for less than that. Uh, he's fortunate that he wasn't, but his, his role was certainly not an honorable role in this matter. And furthermore, there have been 10 skeletons now found. He found, the first, or he'd stumbled across, after they had been found, the first two. And so he's completely unrelated, not directly, not, it wasn't the finder, the first two, and completely unrelated to 80% of the find. And so I don't think uh, he is a principal in this matter at all. And furthermore, they're not that close to Moab. There are a lot of cities closer. LaSalle would be by far the closer. It's about uh, oh, four, maybe five miles away. Moab is well over 20 miles away. And therefore, I think it's appropriate to disassociate the bones from Lynn Ottinger and the term Moab man. Now, here's my wife holding the same bone in the same spot. <laughs> the Creation Evidence Museum has the exclusive excavation rights that they have acquired from the owner of the property. Uh, they have designated the bones the Malachite man. They're stained uh, and replaced with Malachite. And uh, I think that's a much more appropriate designation for the reasons we have suggested. This is where the 70s find was. The finds of the 90s, where the rest of the bones were found, were found more at this location. And the entire site of where they were found is at roughly the same level but over an area 50 by 100 feet. So it's a, a very broad area where they're found, not in one spot. This is a picture taken by some of the archaeologists who were involved in the excavation of the 90s that I obtained from the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management. The blue flag there in the center shows you the spot where two skeletons were found. And also you can see the undisturbed nature of the rock in which they're found. Looking at a closer view, you can see actually some of the bones sticking out of the ground here at this spot. There's another skeleton over there where they're working. But this is typical of the undisturbed, semi-lithified uh, middle layer, if you please, of the Dakota sandstone. Looking closer, you can see she's excavating this bone that is embedded in the rock. Here we see she's taken it down further, and uh, now we see another knee over here showing up. This is one of the few, actually only two, were articulated. They weren't completely articulated. The lower portion, that is, was together as in life. Most of them were just bones piled into place, not articulated. But this one was, we can see the pelvis here, and this sh shows the process of revelation as the... Uh, the rock was moved away. Here she's brushing away some of that which has been excavated. Here's the femur, uh, the foot. Here's the pelvis over here. And then as it's further excavated, you can see the pelvis still embedded in the rock. Here is the, the second leg behind here, still uh, even more embedded, as this one is being disclosed. 
Now, as you look at the previous uh, pictures, you can see the process. Here is where it started, and they begin to uncover taking this out of the rock. And you can actually, as, as it were, be there and see this being revealed. This was the nearby skeleton. I say skeleton. This is a pile of bones. These are not associated. These two may look like they go together like a knee. This is a femur, but this does not go with the femur any more than these two. These were just washed into place, and this is a pile of ribs, not necessarily oriented as in life, but in general, but not, uh, certainly not articulated, which is typical of most of the finds. This is the hole that was left when those two skeletons were removed. Again, you can see the undisturbed nature of the semi-lithified rock out of which they were dug. They were entombed in that rock and they were excavated from that rock. Um, these pictures were not mine. They were from the BLM uh, pictures that they took of the excavation. I took this one earlier this spring. This is that spot. It's been cleaned up and... Uh, uh, the backhoe marks can be seen there, but it does reveal the context. He's standing right about the spot where those skeletons were found. They haven't taken it further back. They're hoping to. They've got to remove the top. It'll cave in on them if they don't. Uh, but this is rock. You can also see the harder layers up above. Uh, this is what the bulldozers ran into. This is the base of the 30s excavation. And this, of course, is the base of the 70s excavation and the spot where the skeletons were found. We took the bones to William R. Maples, who's perhaps, or was perhaps, the leading forensic anthropologist in the world. He wrote the book Dead Men Do Tell Tales. He was famous for cracking the Bundy case. Uh, his lab was in charge of all the Vietnam remains. He was the one who identified Anastasia, her bones. Perhaps the most famous forensic anthropologist in the world. He established and ran, the, and, uh, ran until his death the C.A. Pound Human Identification Laboratory as a part of the University of Florida, part of the uh, museum system there. And he agreed to and did examine two of the skeletons that we carried to him. He says, in answer to the objection that some had made, these were just Indians that had been buried, <laughs> if buried before 1930, 50 feet down through those hard layers, which wouldn't make a lot of sense, but that's the claim. He says the skeletons show no conclusive Indian characteristics. There were some that you could point to, as some had, but you see that in the general population and anyone, he says, that uh, says these are necessarily Indians just doesn't know what they're talking about. That isn't the case. He also pointed out that the skeletons had no collagen in them, and that's a quick and dirty way to determine if they're hundreds of years old or thousands of years old. You take a match, you light the end of it, you smell. And uh, he said there was no collagen there, which would indicate thousands of years as opposed to hundreds of years. This was also confirmed recently uh, by Mike Armitage in a journal publication uh, using a scanning electron microscope showing that there was no collagen in the bones, which would certainly indicate that it wasn't a recent burial. Well, how do we explain this? What's the most reasonable explanation? You've pretty well uh, assimilated the facts. Is it a mining accident? That's probably the standard answer that's being given today. Well, there's some very obvious negative indications of that. First, there's no evidence of tunnels. Zip. Nada. It's not there. I had one archaeologist point to what was a solution cavity that was produced by the spring in the middle. It wasn't associated with the bones. It wasn't anywhere close to them. And it was, you know, maybe three feet in diameter and went back maybe three or four feet into uh, the cliff. But it was a solution cavity and certainly not a tunnel. And certainly it would go in the wrong direction. And... Uh, I don't think they were really serious in their proposal. Apart, you would have to have a tunnel 200 feet long, and uh, you'd see evidence of that somewhere. 
they're dispersed over the wide area of 50 by 100 feet, which doesn't sound like a group huddled together in a mining accident. If it happened after 1930, we would have known about it. Ten people killed in a mining accident after 19. I don't think you'd have had something that obscure that nobody would have known about. If it was before 1930, then you'd have to have a tunnel 200 feet long, and there's no evidence of it. And the, the one who was driving the bulldozers uh, just devoutly affirmed that there was no cracks, there was no break in the layers anywhere. There were four females and an infant in the total of ten, which doesn't sound like a mining operation, does it? Sound like a group of people that got caught in a catastrophe, washed into place. There were no crushed bones. If you got a mining accident, you got crushed bones. No tunnels, widely dispersed. The tunnel would have to be 200 feet long, no evidence of it. An infant, four females, and no crushed bones. As we say in Texas, that dog just won't hunt. That just won't fly as an explanation. And <laughs> top it off, no tools. But all kind of screening. You saw some of the screens that were there uh, in, in the foreground of the excavations in the 90s. Uh, Lynn Ottinger himself said he spent three weeks screening the entire area, found zip, nothing, no tools. That just doesn't look like a mining accident. Well, could it have been a recent burial, which is what some have suggested? Well, there are just all kinds of negative indications here. Fifty feet down in the Dakota sandstone, under undisturbed hard layers. Now, some people like to bury them pretty deep, I guess, but now that's a little absurd. And why would you, <laughs> through rock that was tearing up bulldozers, several layers of that hard, that just doesn't make any sense at all. Most of the skeletons were not articulated, which is what you would expect for a recent burial. The degree of mineral replacement is likewise counter-indicative of a recent burial. The range of radiocarbon dates up to 1,400 years and no collagen is just virtual proof these are not recent burials. Now, what could it have been? Well, maybe an ancient burial. <laughs> Here, all of these factors then become positive indications, don't they? An ancient catastrophic burial, like Steno talked about, 50 feet down in the Dakota sandstone, well, if you saw Jurassic Park, you'd understand why humans normally wouldn't be found around those things. But if you ever find them together, you know it's not because they're 100 million years apart. They lived in different places. But here, uh, together, under, under the hard layers, buried in the catastrophe, would be a kind of thing we'd expect. Some articulated, perhaps, most unarticulated, the fact that there's no collagen in the range of radiocarbon dates is exactly what we would predict. That model fits. A catastrophic ancient burial, not recent, fits this picture. Boy, I guess one of the things we always get is, why isn't there any human fossils in the fossil record? Where are the human bones? And, and uh, Can you comment on that and the Malachite Man discovery? There are human bones, and the Malachite man discovery, I think, is a good indication of that. But the general answer, uh, and it calls for uh, more response than that, because there are billions and billions and billions of clams, and not that many human fossils. Now, there are some. Uh, Brace, in his Human Fossil Atlas, Lawrence C. Brace, who's one of the leading paleoanthropologists in this country, uh, documents uh, just over 3,000 human fossils. So to say there are not that many is relative to the clams, yes, <laughs> but there are quite a few. But the difference, I think, calls for an explanation. Why? Well, what most people don't realize is that the fossil record is well, you, you look at the geologic column and it's almost all the vertebrates, which is a gross distortion. 95% of the entire fossil record is of marine invertebrates. And then another 4.5% are plants and algae. 
Well, that, that's most of it. <laughs> uh, see if I can recall the figure. Uh, one, let's see, one, yeah, 0.00125 percent, about one one hundredth percent of the entire fossil record are of vertebrates. Now, there are a lot more vertebrates in general than there are humans, but we need to understand almost all the fossil record is of marine invertebrates. Now, why is that? I, I think it's a marine deposit. And why don't they show this as, I mean, why, why do they show it as mostly vertebrates? <laughs> if you showed it as mostly marine invertebrates, you might think it's a marine deposit, you know, a, a flood deposit. And they don't want to leave that impression. And so they skew it dramatically away from what is reality. I think we have a flood that buried the world that then was. God designed the flood to destroy the world that then was. It did. It buried things where they lived. And most of the things that got buried were the things that lived lowest in the bottom of the ocean. And that's what we have most of in terms of fossils. What would be buried least? Well, the things that would live highest, higher, and not the bottom of the ocean and would be more mobile and could have enough intelligence to get on top of the hill or grab a log. And that would uh, be the individuals that could uh, escape uh, fossilization. Birds, humans, probably the least common fossil. Uh, those are the most mobile, the ones most likely to be able to escape uh, a catastrophic flood. And so mm, you got humans, probably quite a few of them, buried uh, at the last stages of the flood, up at the top. The ones that weren't buried, of course, didn't become fossils. If they can grab a log and float, then they die, they float and bloat. <laughs> Reptiles sink, mammals don't. To be a fossil, you got to get buried and they would be the least likely. But the ones that did, and some of them would, uh, would be at the highest levels. Then what happens as the flood recedes? It erases the top level. And so being buried last would be most likely also to be erased, eroded, as the floodwaters receded. And so understanding the mobility and the intelligence and the likelihood of being buried together with the erosional factor of the, last, uh, of the, the, the departure of the flood, we would predict there would be very few human fossils, which is exactly what we find. There are thousands, but there are few, relatively. Clams, clams, and more clams is the best way to describe That's what we would predict as well. I think it fits well with the creation model. We, you, you ask about the, the Malachite man. Uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, this is the Dakota sandstone, uh, about 100 million years ago, according to the standard geologic column. And it's a sandstone that's uh, loosely consolidated. You can dig in it with a knife. It's not real hard. Uh, above it is hard, and below it is hard. But here is... Uh, uh, loosely consolidated sandstone and it was the area was exposed with an open pit copper mine in the 30s uh, with a bulldozer uh, they got to a hard layer that was tearing up the bulldozers and so they stopped and wasn't uh, resumed until the 30s and in the the early 30s uh, the fellow that was driving the bulldozer uncovered skeletons and uh, he sort of put them aside and uh, Finally, it was noticed by one of the locals who was interested in fossils at a fossil store. Uh, claimed the find was his. It wasn't. But there were, there were two humans, uh, and we had two halves because the upper halves <laughs> were removed by the bulldozer. Uh, but perfectly modern human skeletons there um, some of those bones were acquired by the museum here. Some of them were kept uh, rather fraudulently, but still were. Uh, 
And then in the 90s, there was more excavation being done by a fellow who had bought the area to uh, uh, excavate some of the uh, azurite module, uh, nodules that were there. Um, and he ran across more bones. And so other archaeologists came in and they actually found remains. Of, we now found some 10 individuals. One was an infant, four of them were females. We carried the bones down to the Pound Human Identification Laboratory at the University of Florida, uh, examined by one of the best known forensic anthropologists in the world at the time, Mr. Maples, Dr. Maples. And one of the questions was, could they be Indians? And he said, while there's some Indian characteristics, you see those characteristics in the general population and what you would expect to see uh, of Indians are not there. And that his conclusion was, no, you cannot conclude that they were. Uh, they're just normal people. There was no collagen in the bones. Zilch. Now that takes normally about a thousand years. Uh, but that was determined by field test and as well as uh, scanning electron microscope. Zero collagen. That's not a recent burial. Uh, one of the standard excavations, now this is 50 feet down in the Dakota sandstone. There was the excavation of the 30s, then of the 70s that went lower. We found aerial photographs of the area from the 30s that were made before the road cut which showed no excavation at all. So you got the road cut in the 30s and then uh, the, the excavation of the mine, the open pit mine, and then in the 70s. All of it was straight across undisturbed in, in these aerial photographs. So um, we, we see that this, this is definitely 50 feet down in undisturbed uh, uh, limestone, sandstone, I'm sorry. Uh, the Dakota sandstone. Uh, I think it's excellent evidence. Uh, they've suggested, well, maybe uh, maybe it was a collapsed mine, but what's the female and the infant doing down there? Why are there no tools? We, we uh, in fact, some of the earlier ar archaeologists that worked there spent weeks screening the material, trying to find any other artifact. There were nothing but bones. These were just washed into place with the sand. And as we say often, these, these were fellows that missed the boat, <laughs> along with a wife and a kid. The last scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they're there, the storage area where they've hidden the, the ark, which I have serious doubts if it exists, but anyway, that picture of uh, we have good men working on it, you know, it's hidden and that's a pretty real depiction. Uh, I think they hide more things than they show. And we've run into that several times. The, uh, the bones from uh, the Malachite man, as we call him, were, the majority of them were donated to the Museum of the Cedars, which is just a little distance away, uh, uh, 20 miles down the road, a nice, museum by the owner of the property. We went down to photograph them and uh, <laughs> we, we had asked for permission to do that. And we told we had to get permission from the BLM. We went to the BLM, the, the head of the BLM there in Moab in his office and at that time he didn't know who I was. I was a geologist. I had my geologist card. Uh, and so he thought I was one of them. <laughs> and so he said, yeah, we, we've hidden these things. We put them in the back of the museum so nobody can see them. Uh, he said, this is a real tar baby. And <laughs> the, the analogy to Uncle Remus and the punching the tar baby and getting stuck, he said, you, you don't want to mess with that. Uh, but anyway, we did get permission. We photographed all of the skeletons that had been found, including the skulls. Um, and they immediately, it was just before they were shipping them off to the Smithsonian. And they did ship them off. They left uh, the week after I was there. Um, but we photographed them before they went.
but they were, he said specifically, they were sent there to be hidden. And they are now hidden. And I guarantee you, if you go to the Smithsonian and ask to see them, they'll tell you they're not there. There is zero evidence uh, for the intrusional burial of these skeletons. In fact, just overwhelming evidence against it. If they're before 1930, this is the way it looked. And remember then what Dawkins says, if you can well verify it, his conclusion is evolution would be utterly destroyed. I think that's exactly what's happened. But anytime you find bones, they're going to be intrusionally buried. That's just the assumption. But he goes on in this discussion of what would test and uh, falsify evolution, saying, ironically, it's also the reason why creationists are so keen on the fake human footprints which were carved during the Depression to fool tourists in the dinosaur beds of Texas. So he's heard about our work down at Glen Rose all the way from Oxford. He refuses to come look, but he's sure that they're fake, but understands that if they were real, this would falsify and utterly destroy. And of course, one of the main reasons that, uh, for the interest is that you can't intrusionally bury footprints, can you? They are where they are. You can't erode them and redeposit and they don't fall down cracks. And so this is really better evidence than the bones, which he understands. Several of you here have traveled with us down to Dinosaur Valley State Park and seen the footprints there. This is where the Paluxy River runs through the park and there are just uh, all kinds of dinosaur tracks all over the place down there. They were made famous back in the 40s by Roland T. Byrd who published a number of articles and we can see the big sauropod-like elephant tracks almost and then the three-toed theropods. Uh, here's one of those three-toed tracks, which is rather unusual. It's raised, which caused us to do some head scratching here. How is it? The tracks should be depressed, shouldn't they? Well, yes, but what happened here? The dinosaur stepped, sunk down, left the depressed track. Other material washed over, filled it in, and what filled it in became harder when it became rock, so that when it's later uncovered and erosion now affects it, the center, the infill is resistant, more resistant to erosion than what's around it, and so it winds up being raised. This is the raised infill. That's significant for some points we'll make again in a moment. But in addition to tracks like this, we also have tracks that look like this. Wonder what that could be. Well, it couldn't be a human track. They, they were 100 million years apart from the dinosaurs, according to the evolutionists. If they're together, it would utterly destroy, and so it, well, this one has to be carved, and this is Dawkins' conclusion. We'll come back to that in a moment. I, I was somewhat intimidated by the objection because it, it was just almost too good to be true, and so we looked around for some that weren't quite so good and found some as well. Here's one in the lower right-hand corner that was identified by the Dallas Crime Lab as a human footprint, but the same criteria they identify footprints at a crime scene, along with dinosaur tracks that had just been excavated. And some of the tracks that we found were very, very human-like. But the explanation was either that this is erosion or uh, they were carved. It has to be one or the other. So we got a new set of objections <laughs> instead of falling down a crack or intrusionally buried. Now then, it's, it's erosion or carved. Well, Stan Taylor decided to test some of these ideas back in the early 70s, taking a bulldozer, uh, backhoe, and following a trail of two tracks that were seen there in the river that came out of the riverbank. Well, they're alternating layers of clay and limestone and clay and limestone, about six feet of them there. And if he removes that and these tracks continue back up under the bank, what would that say about the idea they'd been carved? That'd pretty well rip it, wouldn't it? He did, and yes, found nine more tracks, for a total of 11, in a right-left pattern, some of them very clear and obvious with the mud push-up around it that you can see here, uh, again, arguing against the erosion factor. That doesn't leave... Uh, a ring around the shape. And so a lot of people got excited about this. It looked like very good evidence. And then Glenn Kuban came up with an explanation and he got humanist of the year for this explanation. He says, are these 
kind of duck looking tracks and there are several of those in the area a road to look like the one on the right but the elongate tracks like you see here at B erode over a period of time to finally wind up looking like the one down at the lower right hand corner and that's kind of human like and so these are just eroded dinosaur tracks and now then we don't have to worry about that anymore however when you go back and look at these tracks here are some of the dinosaur tracks with that uh, infill that was harder and what happens with erosion here it gets sharper and clearer because the infill is harder and when you look at a side view the three-dimensional aspect of this shows the center being raised and that's not going to erode to look like a human track is it it looks more like a dinosaur track with more erosion and some of the casts that were made by Stan Taylor were so detailed. Does this look like uh, an eroded dinosaur track? I mean, they're just, uh, just too much detail for that to be a credible thought. You put a human foot in it and it fits perfectly. The one that really persuaded me, and I was trying to play the devil's advocate, is there some way that this could be explained, was this track. And you have to, and this, we extended that 11, series, 11 track series to 14. This was one in the extension. You have to look at this a minute to really see it. As we highlight this area, you can see the dinosaur portion of it. It's about 25 inches long, but look what is in the middle of it. With all five toes and instep and heel. But this one is perfect. Several were saying, well, maybe it's erosion. Others were saying, maybe it's carved. And when you get both, you know it's right in the middle and is exactly as good as it can get. We made a presentation of this at a national science meeting up in Tennessee. Glenn Kuban was there, who won Humanist of the Year for explaining these away. He was on the plane the next morning and in the river that afternoon with a long iron pole. And uh, we got several calls saying he's out there with an iron pole and got out there. And by the time we got there, it looked like this. It had just been beaten to pieces. Uh, of course, we had uh, excellent casts and stereo photographs and uh, hundreds of uh, photographic documentations, but he was evidently pretty impressed with the footprint. As you go further up the trail, this is several tracks ahead, you see another. Now, there are 134 dinosaur tracks on this platform and 14 human tracks going through the middle, and sometimes they're beside and across and just outside, sometimes within. Here again, within. Notice the three-toed dinosaur track up in the anterior forward portion of the track, but in the back portion, it looks like that depressed area is uh, where somebody stepped on it. Again, from a side view of that same track, you see the three toes to the right, almost flush, and perhaps will be raised with further erosion, but the depressed portion fits the human foot just perfectly. When you put your foot in it, it's, it's like a glove. Now, this one is a right. What should we have ahead of it? We should have a left. Here's the next one. And it's right, left for 14. Looking at a side view of this track, you can see that the dinosaur track is beside it. And, uh, of course, the sandbags in the back, it's in the bottom of the river. It's a lot of work to get to do that. It's consistently 11 and a half inches. And this is an overview of the entire 14 track trail. Now, when you get 14 in a right left pattern, consistent in length, you're not looking at erosion. And of course it was excavated, most of it from under the overburden, which eliminates the carving. Now, you can see some strange things in rocks that look like wow that maybe it looks like an Indian head when you go to the cave you know and look at the cave you look up in the clouds and you see wow that looks like a bird you know and maybe some of these tracks just happen to look like a human foot uh, this was a sign I saw up in Oklahoma not long ago you look at that and you say well maybe that's a funny looking cloud but when you see the rest of it you <laughs> you think somebody's messing with the clouds here uh, because you've got more than one and that's not going to happen. You look at the old man in the mountain. Uh, that's maybe erosion, right? But how do you know that this is not erosion? 
Well, if you see four old men in the mountain, you got, got a pretty good idea, don't you? Well, here you've got 14 in a right-left pattern that says, hey, this, I'm sorry, this, this is not erosion, and it's not carved. This becomes the perfect turvy fossil. We did the measurements and the analysis. All of them look at least like a general human footprint, consistent in length, more so than the dinosaur tracks, some of which are still being revealed. Seven of them have toes. Of course, we've shown you the most dramatic ones. That's very unusual with fossil footprints. Mary Leakey's tracks over in Africa, uh, several spreads in National Geographic, none of them have toe. Well, you can see the great toe in some, but none individual toes. Uh, you can distinguish right from left in 12 of the 14. Two of them are just kind of oblong, and when Glenn Kuban lectures on this subject, guess which two he shows you. <laughs> we did a double-blind test at Kansas State University with the psych department, showing pictures. First, what are these? And uh, 80, well, 97% said they're human footprints. Uh, then we got real rough on the college students. Tell us if they're rights or lefts. <laughs> and 87% uh, got exactly what we predicted. Uh, 12 out of 14, that's just about precisely what we expected. And none of them were consistently different so that you can say it is consistently rights and lefts where they ought to be. Now, this is the way you do science. Dawkins sits behind his desk at Oxford and says, no way, it's impossible. And we get out and do the work. And I think you can see the difference. This, I think, is the perfect turvy fossil. You can't fall down a crack, intrusionally bury them. They can't be carved. They were excavated from under the overburden. It's not erosion. You got 14 in a right-left pattern. And I just really enjoy presenting this on the college campus and then sitting back and saying, OK, now, what's your explanation? I was at a university up in Tennessee uh, several years ago speaking to a group of about 50 senior geology students, and uh, they turned around after I finished to the head of the department. Okay, what, what do you have to say? And he said, of course, we don't know that there weren't dinosaurs back there with human feet. And I thought a minute, and I said, well, I, I guess that's right. Uh, it could have been. I also don't know that there weren't human back, humans back there with dinosaur feet. Wouldn't that make about as much sense? Well, I, <laughs> I said, <laughs> wouldn't it be more reasonable to think these things look like dinosaur feet were made by dinosaurs, and these things look like human feet were made by humans? No, he wouldn't agree. And I said, well, if they were made by humans, would they look any different? And he just got up and left. And uh, about half of that, well, a significant portion of that group became creationist. Um, but dinosaurs with human feet uh, is, is their explanation. Uh, Dr. Chuck Finsley, who was curator of the Dallas Museum of Natural History for some 30 years, recently retired, came down to Glen Rose and looked at it. He wanted to display some of the dinosaurs we had excavated. And we made him look at the tracks, and he got a little upset, left, and came back about a month later and got upset and left. <laughs> Third time down, he said, Dr. Patton, I, I think I've got an explanation for you. I can tell you what made these human-looking footprints. He says, I think they were made by aliens. Very serious. And I kind of snickered, and he got aggravated, and... I said, well, Chuck, if they're made by aliens, I guess they came from a galaxy far, far away. They'd be more advanced than we are. What are they doing running around barefooted? <laughs> <laughs> he left. <laughs> but this, this is the best they can do. I think you just ought to take the evidence for what it is instead of desperately trying to explain it away. It kind of reminds me of the Far Side cartoon by Gary Larson. Here's Professor Farrington in his controversial theory that dinosaurs were actually the discarded chicken bones of giant alien picnickers. <laughs> that sounds pretty far out to me. <laughs> if you want to draw a cartoon, uh, I think the reality would be more like this. In the throes of a catastrophic flood, 
as they were trying to escape, they were running, and uh, these were the ones that missed the boat. When we exposed this material, and I think solved the, the riddle of several of the questions that had been asked, found extra tracks, documented the right-left pattern, the length and consistency of the trail, uh, many were pressed with coming up with an answer. What do you say? Well, the typical thing they say, this, I mean, just predict it. <laughs> well, you need more evidence. I mean, that, you can always say that. You, you need more evidence, and they do. And so in 2000, with the drought in this area, we noticed that this trail that's coming across what's called the Patton, well, the trail that's going across it here we could see more of it because the water had gone down. And so we decided to pump the river dry. And so we got quite a few pumps and uh, 30, 40 people down there pretty regularly for over a three month period. And uh, with a lot of work, uh, a lot of shovels, a lot of movement of dirt and watering a lot of farmers fields on either side of the river, uh, we pumped it dry and followed that trail and exposed the longest consecutive dinosaur trail on the American continent. Uh, 154 dinosaur tracks over 500 feet long, and they're not only the, the longest trail, but they may be the clearest and most spectacular trail. The sharp detail is just, just awesome. Now, it really infuriated the fella at the state park who had gotten his PhD studying these tracks that a creationist <laughs> made such a find right under his nose. But we know what dinosaur tracks look like and excavated the longest trail on the American continent. Only one other in the world longer in Turkmenistan. And there's nothing here that looks like dinosaur tracks at all, but when you go up ahead, it crosses this trail of human tracks that are very consistent in length, right, left pattern, all five toes, instep and heel. Then we presented that and guess what they said then? Well, you need more evidence. You know? <laughs> and okay. Let's try the platform up ahead this time, and we moved ahead, and uh, this platform, we had to go down three or four layers till we got to the print layer, and sure enough, there's about 100 dinosaur tracks on this platform with uh, 15 human tracks going right through the middle of it. Different individual, this one was consistently, consistently about 10 inches, but the right-left pattern is obvious, and we look at a close-up here of the center, and we see two tracks that are slightly raised, uh, like the duck foot, uh, dinosaur footprints, uh, but you can see that they match on either side, but the one on the right looks like something stepped in the back of it, doesn't it? And it's depressed, it's not raised. It came along after the infill had filled in the other tracks. Looking at a close-up of the one on the right, we'll see there is that duck-shaped dinosaur track that matches the one next to it perfectly, but again, the depressed track within it is just perfect. And if we had enough dark, you could actually count the knuckles and the toes here. And that's in a sequence of 15 in a right-left pattern. Okay, you want some more evidence? <laughs> it just keeps piling up, and they keep evading. Uh, I think we have just very exciting evidence to confront the evolutionary theories here. We went back to the Burdick track. This one was one that had to be carved. It was too good to be true because, uh, well, it just, uh, it, it, it looked awfully good. So I said, well, is there some way we can tell if this is carved or not? Well, when you section across it, sometimes, as indicated in the question a moment ago, you can see disturbed material underneath the surface, and so we sectioned, as you can see, several places. Here is a section at the heel, and in the center, you can see the displaced, disturbed material. Is this a carved track? Now, this is original impression. Carving would cut across rather than corresponding with uh, the disturbed material. We presented this at a science meeting in Dallas, and it got rather quiet. And then finally, one person said, well, this is obviously a real track, but it must be a dinosaur track that somebody carved toes on. 
<clears throat> and I'm glad he did that because then we proceeded to section across the toes, as you can see here. And this is a real reach because sometimes you section a dinosaur track and you see nothing. Uh, but we were lucky with the fine grain limestone preserved a lot of detail. Here is a section across the toes and especially there at the great toe. You can see the following contours rather than cutting across them. Looking at a close up here uh, and actually there are structures under each of the toes but uh, very dramatic at the great toe. And so we verify even at the toes that this is not a carved track. Then we get a new set of objections. They say, well, but it's too broad at the front, it's too narrow at the heel, and look at the center, it's raised. Tracks are not supposed to be raised in the middle. Um, and of course, they had no idea what tracks are supposed to look like, and we didn't either, and so we went out and did some science. We got some uh, junior high kids to make some tracks in the concrete, and we found out that standing tracks and Walking tracks and running tracks are pretty easy to distinguish. They all look different. And what we're looking at here is a running track. Here is a little 12-year-old girl that made these tracks, uh, running both toward and uh, uh, away from us, looking at two here going in opposite directions. Uh, we can see the broad front here and the toes that are spread out, the narrow heel, and look at the raised center. When you're running, you push off with your toes, and so you have a broader front, and you rock over the center and leave the... We didn't know that, but what we learned indicated that if it were different, it would be wrong. The Burdick track is a very good running track. Uh, difficult even to make one that good today, but the same general configuration. Also in the area, we had a large cat track. There were seven of these. Uh, Dawkins said a large mammal skull, I think a large mammal foot would <laughs> fit the bill as well. This one is large. We talked about large animals the other evening. This one's nine inches across. Big cat. Uh, and that would utterly destroy, according to Dawkins' criteria. We sectioned here across this, which they'd have to say was carved. And again, you see the following contours across the pad of the cat track showing that this is not carved either. This is a turvy fossil. All of this, of course, around Glen Rose. Let's go down to Sonora, Texas. Here is a sequence of three tracks. One of them, uh, you can see very clearly, is not just erosion in a rock, but very much like a human track. There are nine of them in a right-left pattern that can be followed there at Sonora. Up in the Panhandle at Stinnett, Texas, there's been on display for about 30 years a rock slab there in the center of the, of the courthouse that uh, obviously looks like a human foot in the Permian rock. This is supposedly 100 million years older than the ones at Glen Rose. Well, this has to be carved. It's just too clear, the little small foot and then the big one. But look at the thin layer that's revealed here by the broken section and compare it with the depth of the track looking sideways and you can see that the depth is considerably deeper than that little thin layer and if it were carved what would happen to that little thin layer it would penetrate wouldn't it and it didn't so we can see good indication this is not a carved track we have found out where this uh, came from the area we've done a lot of research we're doing an excavation beginning in two weeks uh, there at Stinnett and hope to find some more in place. Uh, but we don't find them just at Glen Rose by any means. This one is in New Mexico, again in the Permian, even worse for the evolutionist than the situation at Glen Rose. The photograph is a little bit deceitful in that uh, you wouldn't see that picture if you walked up on it. Uh, it's an extremely shallow track and you have to have it wet and the sun angle just right in order to get the pretty picture like this. But when you do, you can see this very obviously is a clear track, but it's one that is like the kind of footprint you'd leave when you're walking with a wet foot on a tile floor. You're not sinking down that much. You get the hourglass shape with the little dots at the end, but we recognize that shape, don't we? And that's obviously a turvy fossil. 
Uh, in Turkmenistan that we mentioned earlier, there are a lot of dinosaur tracks. This is from Pravda. Uh, under the headline, Human Footprints Found on Dinosaurs Plateau, Turkmenian Plateau contains more than 3,000 footprints, but among the most mysterious fact is that among the footprints of dinosaurs, footprints of bare human feet are found. We've contacted a number, a number of, of Russian scientists. Uh, they don't like to talk about it, so, not all of them. Some of them uh, actually do and uh, have gotten in trouble as a result of it. Uh, we had this fellow who had published science in the USSR uh, agreed to carry us there. He was head of the geology department at the University of Turkmenistan. Uh, I got the visa, wasn't cheap, <laughs> ready to go and uh, they fired him and he had to leave the country. Uh, when we applied for the permits uh, they found out we were coming. They don't like that to be known. But in this journal, he says, if we speak about the human footprint, and notice he's still just a little bit equivocating here, it was made by a human-like animal. He's not really sticking his neck out there, but <laughs> obviously so. Incredibly, the footprint is on the same plateau where there are dinosaur tracks. And he's led three expeditions there to investigate. He has offered to carry us sneaking across the border from Kazakhstan, where he is now, it's about six miles from Afghanistan, and we decided that we we're going to wait a little while. This amazing fossil is from the Glen Rose area. This is my daughter's finger underneath. Uh, we recognize what that looks like, uh, but there are lots of rocks that just happen to look like things accidentally. And so we wanted to see if there's any interior structure. Sometimes you find that in fossils, sometimes you don't. And so we sectioned here at a severe angle to get more information to see if there's any interior structure there. And sure enough, right at the intersection, right where it's supposed to be, we see the bone material in the center of this fossil finger. Uh, this is Dr. Dale Peterson of uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, the last time I heard him lecture on this, it was an hour and a half lecture, and you don't want to know all about that, but he did the CAT scans and traced ligaments from one end to the other, and he has absolutely no doubt as a professional anatomist that this is a human finger. A little further south, uh, 100 miles south of Glen Rose, we go near London, Texas, down toward Junction, uh, Fredericksburg in that vicinity. And in this uh, picturesque spot, uh, a number of years ago, a gentleman was fishing and looked at a rock and saw something sticking out of it and picked it up and hit it, and lo and behold, it's got a hammer in it. And the rock from this area, you look on all the geologic maps, this is lower Cretaceous, the same formation at Glen Rose, but lower down in the formation, supposed to be 140 million. But this is steel with an iron hammer. It's not hammer steel. It's a different type. No hammer is sold today made of this. The wooden handle is partially colified with quartz and calcite crystals in it, encased in the Cretaceous sandstone. Uh, I don't think the dinosaurs made that, but it's found in the rocks with the dinosaurs. Up in Oklahoma, we found this iron pot, which was in the coal that's supposedly 300 million years old. Man, according to the evolutionists, it's been around maybe a million, two million, depending on how you define him. But 295 million, you've got an iron pot. And this is the affidavit of the fellow who was working in the utility department there, uh, stoking the big furnace, and uh, he took a sledgehammer and broke the coal open and out popped the pot with the cast and the mold on either side. Uh, not supposed to be there. Similar situation here with this bell that was found in North Carolina uh, a number of years ago encased in coal again with the cast and the mold on either side. Uh, a close-up shows that this is not like things that we know about today but it's uh, it was encased in the coal. We have not only an affidavit from him, but he passed a lie detector test with flying colors that his story was true. Yeah, just go ahead and give you some background, education. Education. 
Well, I went four years at Florida College, Tampa, Florida, studying Bible, and thought I was three. Uh, started preaching and always interested in science, and so I was lecturing on creation, evolution, and uh, found out it helped to know what I was talking about. So I went back to school, took more courses, and uh, another 15 years we finally finished. Uh, but we attended at Indiana University and Purdue, did uh, some work at Cambridge, and finally finished in Australia. Uh, doctorate is actually in education. We finished all of the work uh, for a degree in geology, uh, but the accreditation was withdrawn. Uh, Clifford Wilson was the president there of the school, and uh, they didn't like him giving degrees to creationists, and that was withdrawn, and so we worked another two years and finished where it was accredited in education. Well, when did you become a Christian? And just can you give me your testimony real quick? Uh, my father preached for 67 years, and I uh, became a Christian when I was 11 years old, uh, a couple of years ago. <laughs> and uh, I've been preaching full time since 1963 and uh, doing work as a geologist as well uh, for a brief time earned a living as a geologist uh, but mainly had been preaching and then would go on expeditions excursions as uh, opportunity uh, arose I became acquainted with the footprints down here in 1972 uh, <clears throat> That's probably ahead of most of the folks that you're interviewing. The film had just been made, uh, Footprints in Stone. And in fact, it wasn't fully edited, put together, but was shown in raw form in a creation uh, conference up in Minneapolis. And I was in, in Indianapolis at the time, actually going to school at Indiana University and drove up and spent the week there in Minneapolis and heard a number of the creation speakers, including Andy Morris and Dwayne Gish. And uh, when they showed that film, it just lit my fire. It just thrilled me. And I, it was positive evidence. Bones, you can erode, redeposit, they can be intrusionally buried, but you can't do that with tracks. They are where they are. And when you see them as clearly as you can see them in Cretaceous limestone, that, that just rips it. I mean, that just is absolute proof. And so I got very excited about that, and I wanted to see them myself. I was uh, doing a creation seminar in Houston, Texas, and uh, there were a couple of young teenagers uh, that were skeptics. Uh, their parents attended where I preached. I got them to go with me on this trip. We rented a motorhome, drove down, did a week-long seminar at Houston. They had to listen to all that, and then on the way back, we came to Glen Rose. And I got to see the footprints, and they got to walk in them and stick their feet in them and feel that they fit. <laughs> and they became devout Christians, and uh, we found a place to baptize them, and they were, they were Christians as a result of that. I saw the effect, and I, I, I believe this was very good evidence. We learned more through the years, and more evidence was revealed with further uh, erosion. We could only see the human tracks at that point. We didn't realize that there were dinosaur tracks there as well, and when that began to appear, it caused some doubts. And because I didn't fully understand what was being seen, I quit using them for a number of years, and then moved to Dallas. I was there for 25 years, and introduced myself to Dr. Ball and said, I'm here to help. <laughs> uh, we worked and dug and pumped and studied uh, year after year and watched the change from year to year of the tracks. And uh, I believe we documented exactly what the situation was. We, they were right both times. Yes, these were human tracks, and yes, they're dinosaur tracks. They're, they're both there which really makes the case even stronger. But uh, we actually extended the Taylor Trail for several more tracks. Some of them we uncovered for the first time 
uh, minus 3B, which was just pristine when we uh, put the hose on it and watched the debris lift out of it for the first time. It was just absolutely perfectly clear. All five toes and instep and heel uh, within a dinosaur truck. On that platform, there are 135 dinosaur tracks, but 14 clear human tracks and a couple more that are vague ahead, but 14 that we can document in a right left pattern uh, that are going right through the dinosaur tracks, beside and within and among the dinosaur tracks. We've listened to the objections. Uh, it's erosion. Well, right, left, right, left, 14, that's you, you look at the old man in the mountain, you, well, maybe that's erosion. But when you see four old men in the mountain up in Mount, up in Mount Rushmore, this, this is not erosion. Not possible. The sequence is really profoundly strong. Uh, they were excavated, most of them, from under overburden. So it's, it's not carved. Uh, th th this is perfect evidence. And we hear some say, well, it's erosion. Well, but you, you can't get erosion making all five toes in step, heel, and right, left pattern. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, carved, well, it was under the overburden. Had to get back under the, the layers, about six feet of alternating clay and limestone. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, I was presenting this uh, at a State University in Tennessee to a group of senior geology students, and I showed them the tracks and showed the process by which we came to this conclusion. And uh, there were about 50 grad students uh, there, and they had no response. They turned around and looked at the head of the department, you know, what, what do you got to say? And he said, well, of course, we don't know that there weren't dinosaurs back there with human feet. And I thought a minute, and I said, well, I, I guess that's right. We, we don't know that. We also don't know that there weren't humans back there with dinosaur feet. It seemed like that would make about as much sense. <laughs> Wouldn't it make more sense to say these things that look like human feet were made by human These things look like dinosaur feet were made by dinosaurs. That, that just seems, maybe it's what it looks like it is. Uh, and he didn't, didn't agree. Uh, I said, well, if they were human tracks, would they look any different? And he left. <laughs> I had a good conversation with Chuck Finsley, who's a gentleman, a uh, very devout evolutionist and uh, a believer in, in God, uh, who was uh, curator of the Dallas Museum of Natural History for about 30 years, retired uh, maybe 10 years ago. But he came down and looked and got upset and left and came down and wanted to display some of the bones that we had excavated from Acrocanthosaurus. Uh, we made him look at the tracks. <laughs> and he, he just got upset and, and left. And uh, he said, finally, the third time down, he said, Dr. Patton, I, I have the answer. He said, I, I, I know what these things are that look like human tracks. That they're really not human tracks. They, they were made by aliens. And he was just as serious as he could be. And I kind of snickered and he, he got aggravated. And I, I said, when I checked, if, if they're made by aliens, I guess they came from a galaxy far, far away. They'd be more intelligent than we are. What are they doing running around barefoot? <laughs> he didn't like that. But he had, I mean, this is the answer. The dinosaurs with human feet or Aliens are, they really don't have a good answer for it. I think it's the, the perfect uh, response. They, they cannot be intrusionally buried. Uh, with a pattern of uh, 14 and a right left pattern, with many of them all five toes in step, it's just, it's unnatural. And believe me, I have presented it and given opportunity. I stick my chin out on the college campuses all over the country, maybe a hundred different places, times. Glenn Keeman would say, 
I guess they were, they were tridactyl prints. And how do you distinguish between a human footprint and a heel impression of a dinosaur? Well, you don't have all five toes, instep, heel. It, it's just uh, 25 feet, 10 and a half inches, 11 inches. Uh, <laughs> the configuration of the figure eight with the dots at the end is unique to humans. Um, any four-year-old can look at it <laughs> and tell the difference. Uh, you can see a general human shape with some of them if you don't have that much detail. But the kind of detail you see with minus 3B just defies that explanation. All you have to do is look and be honest. Now, not all of them meet that criteria. So I finally came to Glen. I was completing the Masters in Archaeology. I had referred to the possibility that there were human footprints among dinosaur footprints. So my mentor, Dr. Clifford Wilson, said, if you're going to refer to that, uh, I'm assigning you an actual excavation. You'll need to go to Glen Rose and perform an actual excavation. Well, this is not archaeology. This is paleoanthropology and it's paleontology. But I had to learn and perform uh, the procedure for uh, an enterprise such as that. So I got volunteers and did. At that point, I still personally held to the long ages. I accommodated the dinosaurs in the Mesozoic era of the past, and I felt that there was some substantiation to the geologic column from the what is now called progressive creation from the introduction of basic life forms, later reintroduction of more complicated life forms, but all life forms are incredibly complicated. So I was not justified in that, but uh, that's what many people do. I held to long ages and put the dinosaurs back in the Mesozoic era 228 million to 64 million years ago, and I felt justified. That's the position I held. And then I came to Glenrose, performed the excavation. And to my absolute amazement, after excavating 19 dinosaur footprints, continuing the original excavation of removing the overburden and delicately excavating through the clay marl, I was following that trail of dinosaur footprints. I was ready to stop the excavations. And uh, one of the assistants said, you just show us what to do, we'll do the work. Let's take a, one more slab. Okay, removed another slab. At the end of that slab, as I excavated through the clay, there was not only dinosaur footprint, but 17 and a half inches from the dinosaur footprint, delicately excavating with wooden implements. There was a 16 inch human footprint. Now that blew my mind because my paradigm didn't accept that. Even as a Christian, I had compromised and had accommodated the long geologic ages. That blew my mind. Uh, so I continued the excavations. That was a left, we got a right, another left, and another right. I called the press. They flew down by helicopter, put it front page, Fort Worth Star Telegram, track step on evolution. I didn't sleep for four days and nights because it, it, blew, it blew everything I had adopted. So I then had to continue the excavations to find more evidence to substantiate and verify what I uh, found. And I did continue the excavations. More footprints were found. To date, we've excavated over 90 human footprints among over 600 dinosaur footprints, all in original excavation procedure. So I then had to go back to embracing the absolute truth of man and dinosaur living contemporaneously. 
And Dr. Ernst Mayer debating Dr. Dwayne Gish. Dr. Dwayne Gish, a marvelous friend of mine who is a tremendous creation scholar. Dr. Ernst Mayer, leading biologist at Harvard of the modern school of evolutionary compromise, admitted in the debate, if your friends along the Paluxy, Dr. Gish, can actually prove that man and dinosaur lived contemporaneously, that'll blow the entire theory of evolution. We'll have to start all over again with some other scenario. Uh, and that's true. But there are only two scenarios possible, only two. Either the universe arrived and we arrived in the universe as living systems by a naturalistic process, or the universe arrived and we arrived in this universe by supernatural design and creation. No one can introduce an alternative, only these two. Well, since the biblical record had been correct all along, uh, I have spent the last 30 years building the museum, and only the creator himself has been able to provide the funding on the shoestring where we operate for this very fine museum. We began in a log cabin uh, and a tin shed. We now have a very fine museum. We have priceless artifacts that are in full 24-hour security surveillance in numerous dimensions. So we, I began searching and raising the funds independently for independent artifacts, such as the hammer, the London artifact found near London, Texas, an iron hammer whose constituency we cannot uh, duplicate precisely. They were more intelligent than we found encased concretionally encased in what originally was termed Ordovician, uh, supposed to be hundreds of millions of years old, later was termed uh, by the geologic community in a small area that was early Cretaceous, assigned an age of 140 million years. I want to emphasize those ages are not there, they're simply assigned. So we got the London artifact, uh, that was a miraculous acquisition. And then, over the years, one artifact after another. And then, uh, we got the verdict print. But we had to actually cut the verdict print with a lapidary saw in order to see if the laminations were there, the compression densities were there. Well, they were, but we had to cut it. And in so doing, uh, to some degree, it was compromised. And then, one day, it dawned on me. And I'm sure the creator nudged. <laughs> it dawned on me. There's modern technology, and you have laboratory friends who've invited you to bring the artifacts there. There's modern technology, tomographic technology, to read through rock. Now there's spiral CAT scan technology where you can not only read through it, but you can segment it and interpret it. So working with two independent certified laboratories, I began to take the artifacts, particularly the footprints, and they gladly, at their expense, CAT scanned these and gave us the full results. And every single expert technician said on the spot, there's compression density under these tracks, there's compression density at various points beside these tracks, but only in a limited area showing the actual compression and the motion of the footprint, both of dinosaur footprints and human footprints. So now we did not have to compromise what we had found and uh, what we had in our possession. We could determine what was genuine, what was not genuine. And all of these artifacts that we have in the museum have been demonstrated in two different laboratories to be absolutely genuine. But that introduces a problem. In the 1930s, Ernest Talbert Bull Adams, an incredible genius who lived in this area, completed Oxford in three years. Uh, Ernest Talbert Bull Adams was a brilliant man. His brother, George Adams, was quite intelligent as well, but he was not educated like his brother. Um, some human footprints had been found along dinosaur footprints. 
The first dinosaur footprints were discovered by Ernest Talbert Bull Adams, but it was uh, Charlie Moss who discovered the first human footprints when he came back from the war, was recuperating in his hometown. First human fo footprints among dinosaur footprints after a spring flood had ripped up the ledge. Well, Bull Adams examined them, and Bull Adams, the scholar, Oxford scholar, who grew up here as well, um, thought that actually, since he was an anthropologist, he felt that the earliest evidence of man was at Glen Rose. So he gave this a technical primitive name. And actually, while this has been verified by Dr. Aaron Judkins and others, that there is this phenomenon of human footprints in rock, sedimentary rock worldwide, while that's been verified, at that point, this was the only evidence. So it was the first evidence of earliest man. But at that point, Ernest Talbert Adams had not divested himself of the long evolutionary time scale. I'm not sure he ever did. Many born-again scholars never divest themselves of that concept. So here's the problem. It was depression time. And some of the old timers went to the bed of the river. And after days of laborious activity, sometime the wife holding the chisel while the husband swung the sledge, they cut out dinosaur tracks, banded them, showed them alongside the road, and sold them to passers-by for $200. That was a lot of money in the Depression. So George Adams cut out one or two human footprints and sold them. Then he realized he was a stonemason, and he was quite good. So he started carving five or six dinosaur footprints and two or three human footprints. He was quite good at it. So good that the Smithsonian learned that he had some human footprints and they sent a representative down. Well, he thought they would somehow learn that he had carved them. They were stylized a bit, but they were stylized after some of the genuine tracks. And uh, so he only had one left and he hid it, he buried it. And it was carved. After long, Decades of time, the old home place, the George Adams home place, sold. The family gave a friend of mine the right to check for artifacts on the property. He dug up that track, brought it to me, the original that was carved. Decades of osmosizing flow of moisture had dissolved some of the surface so that I was able to determine how he carve them. He used a cold chisel with a flat head. So you wouldn't cut pock marks in the rock. He actually abrased it. He was a good stonemason so that it was smooth, but it was still fractured under the area where the cold chisel uh, vibrated. So there were then pock marks that were not in the original. I took the original to two separate certified laboratories. There were no compression density lines whatsoever under that carved print. And that's exactly what I expected and what the uh, technicians expected. It was demonstrated as being carved. In contradistinction to our genuine footprint, some that we've excavated, some we've acquired, like the O.W. Willett print, like the Delt print, we know precisely where the delt print came from. We know precisely where the willet print came from. The hole is still there on the park ledge. It was taken out before it was against the law to do so. Everything we want to be proper and right. So here we have the opportunity to demonstrate what is genuine and what is not. Now, the evolutionary community, every time we get a new artifact and it's publicized, they say, oh, well, everybody knows. Those tracks along the Paluxy uh, were carved, those human footprints were carved, and they hang up the phone. They don't give you an opportunity to explain. Some were carved, no question about it. But some were not carved, 
And we can demonstrate what has been carved and what has not been fabricated. We can demonstrate what is absolutely genuine. And that we've done. Uh, now. How many were, do you know how many were carved and also? Uh, yes. Uh, George Adams' son-in-law came to talk to me when I first came here. He helped George carve some of those. And uh, he, uh, he said that George and he carved, George started carving and then the son-in-law got in. He helped him. They carved five or six, no more, dinosaur tracks in either two or three human tracks. That's all, no more. So that, that brings up the uh, controversy of the Taylor Trail. The, the Taylor Trail was demonstrated to be, uh, it was excavated by Stan Taylor. It was originally discovered by the late J.C. McFall. And uh, the Taylor Trail was extended by Stan Taylor. They brought in equipment that they used hand operation as well. And they did find a series of human footprints. So creationists used that. Films were made. They were shown hundreds and hundreds of times across the country on campuses, in churches, in private groups uh, with tremendous response. But then uh, an individual came down after the water was low and found that as he examined the Taylor Trail, there were some tridactyl reptilian claw stains in the Taylor Trail. So that made worldwide news. Wait a minute. Those are not human footprints after all in the Taylor Trail, in the bed of the Paluxy River. Those footprints were made by dinosaurs because the claw stains are there. Case closed. Not really. Don Patton and I then over a period of years, watched, observed, cleaned under various conditions, summer, winter, spring, fall, high water, low water. We found that when the, when the water was only two or three inches deep and relatively clear, the ultraviolet radiation brought out the stains. But when the water was a few inches deep, the ultraviolet radiation couldn't penetrate and the stains weren't there. The stains were genuine. A dinosaur had stepped there. So it is a trail of dinosaur footprints, but that's not all. Within that trail of dinosaur footprints, and by the way, that trail is the longest, the third longest contiguous dinosaur trackway in the continental United States. In that trail are 14 human footprints, sometimes stepping in the middle of the dinosaur track where the claw stains were found, sometimes stepping slightly to the side, moving around in that track, and sometimes, like in plus six, stepping to the side of the dinosaur track. So it is a trail of dinosaur footprints, but it's in 14 of them, it was intersected and paralleled by a human being with an 11 and a half inch human footprint. One of the pristine tracks that Don Patton and I discovered originally was the minus 3B, uh, essentially perfect in every detail, and it moved around in that track. So the Taylor Trail was compromised in that originally it was thought to be only a trail of dinosaur footprints. It was found to be a trail of dinosaur footprints, but it is also a trail of human footprints within those dinosaur footprints. So, so you believe the tracks in the Paluxy River are human? Absolutely. I, I don't, I, I think it is maybe the best evidence that we have. Uh, not because it smacks the average person in the face. Presenting evidence to a scientist, presenting it to a general audience, Proving it to the technical matter, all, all very different processes. Um, when we found the, the boot out in West Texas uh, with the fossilized cowboy leg in it, 
that really speaks to a general audience. But now, geologists in general know that there's lots of things like that. You know, things get petrified quickly. They, they don't tell the public that, and the public gets, wow. You know, but, but when you, you understand how the geologist thinks, every objection that they can make is answered. It can't be an intrusional burial. That's the, if you find bones like the Malachite now, that's an intrusional burial. It has to be. You don't have to have evidence for it. You just know it is. You can't do that with tracks. If you erode them, they're gone. <laughs> Redeposit, you, you can't do that. Uh, it can't be carved because they were excavated from under the overburden. It's not erosion because it's the right, left, right, left, or 14 with all five toes. And all of the objections are answered. Now, there are different objections than with the bones. I mean, it, it, it uh, eliminates some of the objections that they can make for bones, but you have new ones. But then the new ones you can eliminate with the fact they're from under the overburden, the sequence of 14, and the detail that you can see. I don't think there is a rational answer that they can give for. If I'm going to pick one, and I, I've spoken on dozens, hundreds of <laughs> college campuses, for the past 30 years. And if I was going to pick one thing to present, that, that's what I'd pick. Uh, I presented this, uh, by the way, not uh, about three years ago at Texas A&M Commerce. I was invited by the head of the physics department, which is a little unusual. I'm not a physicist, uh, hard rock geologist. Uh, but the student that had listened to me lecture, I think it was at Sulphur Springs, was a student there uh, physics, uh, uh, studying physics. And so he arranged it, and so here were about uh, 50, well, 20 professors and another 50 grad students in physics that invited me to come speak. I said, well, I like to talk about things that I know more about than my audience. And so I'm not going to talk about physics. <laughs> I want to talk about fossils and rocks. And I presented the evidence from Glen Rose, from the footprints. And I did it in detail, and I went through all the objections and answers, and uh, it took me close to an hour, and sat down. The head of the physics department, at uh, Texas A&M Commerce got up and I can quote you exactly verbatim what he said. He said, I find that absolutely unassailable and unanswerable and sat down. And we had another hour responding to questions, but they were very information oriented. They wanted to know. Uh, when you present this, knowing the kind of objections that people make and anticipate that and provide the information, it just, they have nothing to say. There's nothing they can't say. That's usually, at the booths, as we find out, is most people just listen. The people that, that don't agree with it are arguing right off the bat or they just leave. The, the more people know about geology, the more powerful the evidence is. People can think, well, yeah, the dinosaur made the footprint and it stayed mud for 60 million years and then a human walk. <laughs> mud is going to hold a track for 60 million, <laughs> for, for a week. You know, it's not, <laughs> mud, the next time it rains, it's gone. You know, if it's not hardened, like concrete, I mean, it, we see footprints made today. People walk in wet concrete. How else do you see footprints made at last? It doesn't happen. You've got to have base, and that's, of course, what limestone is, <laughs> calcium carbonate. Same thing as concrete. Uh, I think it was chemically precipitated, and uh, they were walking over the wet concrete, and it hardened before the next tide came in, which presented 
material from this direction, clay, and then limestone precipitate, and clay and limestone, alternating layers from different directions, tidal effects. But in the next layer, you've got the same kind of tracks. In the next layer, the same kind of tracks. But the standard geology explanation would be that these same critters stayed there in the same area for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, it, it's nuts. The, the cyclic phenomenon calls for a cyclic explanation. Tides operate in cycles. This is what we're looking at. I don't think they have a good explanation for that. It's way down here in the lake bottom for clay and then way up a little higher but still ocean bottom for limestone. Then it repeats that sequence sometimes 10 times in some places. Down, up, down, up in a regular sequence for hundreds, millions of years. It was a tide back and forth and back and forth every day. Makes much more sense. You want to talk about the Mike Turnage and Patton Turnage Trail? Um, when you present this evidence, they have to say something. And they're desperate when they talk about aliens or dinosaurs with human feet. What, what can you say? Sometimes about the only thing can be said is, well, that, that looks, I understand what you're saying, but you need more evidence. I mean, you can always say that. You need more evidence. So uh, in the year 2000, there was a drop here in Texas. And we could see this trail that was going across the Taylor Trail that had been discovered initially by uh, Turnage uh, back when Stan Taylor was uh, excavating in about 72. And more of it was revealed. And so, okay, let's see where this goes. Let's see what we can find. And so we started pumping the river dry. The uh, farmers appreciated that. There was a drought. They needed water. And so we watered their fields <laughs> by emptying the river. And we sandbagged and blocked and worked for about two months to expose this trail. It was actually the longest continuous trail on the American continent at the time over 500 feet of consecutive dinosaur tracks, uh, 154 tracks. Beautiful. Some of them uh, may be the best looking dinosaur tracks. The, the longest trail on the continent and maybe the best tracks on the continent. Just a spectacular trail. But they're dinosaur tracks. It, it's just very obvious and the clearer they are, the more obvious that is. Some of them not Know, pristine, but many of them are. We know what dinosaur tracks look like. We excavated the longest consecutive trail on the continent. Several side trails could be seen as well. But you get up to that uh, other end where it crosses the Taylor Trail, it's a different critter altogether. And here we have 14 in a right left pattern of perfectly human, consistent in length, uh, human like tracks. Um, well, we did that, and they said, well, you need more evidence. <laughs> and so we excavated the platform in front of it. Uh, and this one, uh, it, it was about the size of a platform, about the size of the, the platform of the, the Taylor Trail. About 100 dinosaur tracks were there. We came down two or three layers to get to this one and uh, got a lot of people to help us. Mopped and cleaned. And my wife said she never really got it. You know, she can mop the kitchen floor, but mopping the bottom of a river, she never got used to it. A lot of work. And exposed the dinosaur tracks, and sure enough, right through the middle was another human like trail. This one was a different individual, about 10 inches. Uh, and uh, there were 15 in this sequence. Uh, about three of them particularly were just spectacular with strong mud push up around it. Uh, the adjacent uh, dinosaur tracks were a different type of dinosaur. It looked like a, a duck, big duck track instead of the more elongated tracks associated with the Taylor Trail. Um, 
but it was just a, a spectacular example. So we've got two trails, one 14 in length, one 15 in length, one averaging 11 and a half inches, the other averaging 10 inches. Uh, the 11 and a half inch trail, if the proportions are average, it would have been about 6'4". Uh, the 10 inch track is more average, closer to 6 feet. So a fairly normal individual. Other tracks, like the Burdick track, are considerably larger, uh, more like uh, Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, the foot is almost the same size. In fact, one size smaller than Shaquille O'Neal's. And so the, the evidence just accumulates. Uh, travel with me to Utah. This is near the Four Corners area, near Blanding, Utah, under the arches at uh, Natural Bridges National Monument. And here, uh, Dr. Swift down there, who was working with me, is pointing up where the era is to uh, a protected area where the Anasazi Indians uh, did their petroglyphs about a thousand years ago, according to the park rangers. And you climb up there on that little ledge and look at that, and you see a number of the petroglyphs. It's covered with heavy desert varnish so that it's difficult to photograph. But uh, right over my head, you see the Anasazi warrior and then the snakes. But then right beside me, if we highlight the significant area, you can see the dinosaur, which even uh, the secular archaeologists have acknowledged sure looks like a dinosaur and covered with the varnish so that the antiquity is, is really not questioned. We go not too far from there, but over into Colorado, we see the three-horned Dinosaur with the frill on its back looks more like a triceratops than the people uh, look like people. This is uh, done by the Fremont Indians who were contemporary with the Anasazi. And then we go to the Grand Canyon. We see what appears to be in the shape of uh, maybe an Allosaurus. Uh, someone shot him in the tail, which shows you what it looks like if you break through that heavy desert varnish, which indicates its antiquity. There was a, a write-up by a representative for the American Museum of Natural History in 1924 of this site describing Indians drawing dinosaurs, uh, though they wouldn't do that today. Uh, not because the evidence is not there, they just wouldn't do it. We travel down to Peru, and uh, this is Dr. Javier Cabrera, who was 20 years head of the Department of Medicine at the University of Lima, retired to be cultural anthropologist in Inca, Ancestor of the Conquistadors has a big 300-year-old castle there on the town square and has a collection of Inca burial stones that uh, begun to be made by his father back in the 30s. He's continued that collection. These are stones that are buried with the, in the tombs with the, the Incas and they have scenes carved over them, most of them. He has a collection now of over 11,000 of these burial stones. About a third of them are the most disgusting pornography you've ever seen, but about a third of them have dinosaurs on them. Here is one in place in the tomb, but looking at a close-up of these stones, you can see the rather artistic rendition of the dinosaur. Interestingly, this one has the dermal frills on its back when Mr. Sinclair did his sign with the dinosaur. He didn't know that it had frills on its back, but they did it right. This was written up in Geology Magazine in 1992 for the first time when we found them well preserved. But there are thousands of these stones. This is one of the larger ones. Again, rather artistically rendered. Looking at a close-up, you can see the dinosaur in the upper right-hand corner with the man foot in his mouth. All shapes and sizes and types of stones and uh, styles uh, of rendering certainly not done by the same individual. Uh, some of them are almost oriental looking and some of them rather literal looking. Uh, here's one with a number of different species on it, but thousands of them. We have a number of others who have collected as well. We have a collection at the Aeronautical Museum in Lima. There were hundreds here. There are 40 that are left. They've been raided, uh, I think sold maybe <laughs> illegally. But you can still see the stones, some of the ones that are not as elaborate and beautiful as in the Cabrera collection, but obviously recognizable. 
Still in the National Aeronautical Museum, there's also a display in the Naval Museum and at least two other museums that I know of in, in Peru. Some of them uh, are still being excavated. This was one that was excavated in 2006 that is in the artifact room. It has two dinosaurs on it, slightly different type stone from Cabrera's, raised instead of incised, but still the same general picture. Also in the tombs, you find burial cloths with the same kind of motif there. Uh, obviously, uh, the big claws and the teeth representing dinosaurs. You see it on their pottery. That's relatively easy to date. These are dated at about 2,500 years ago. Uh, these are the Moshi pots, and the style is well known and documented and represented in the National Museums. This one's in the National Museum in Lima. It says circa 2,500 years ago. Up in northern Peru, you have a good deal of gold in some of the, the ruins and tombs. This is a death mask, but look on either side of the face. <clears throat> Again, the dermal frills across the back, the tail curling up over and the huge teeth. These people were seeing dinosaurs 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Now, we're told that we've known what dinosaurs look like for maybe... Well, the first ones found in 1820, we didn't know what they looked like very well. The render, restorations were silly. Uh, after the turn of the century, early 1900s, we got a fair idea and really not an excellent idea. And, well, 1992, we learned the uh, Brontosaurus type had frills on its back. Uh, <clears throat> these people didn't show a gradation in learning. They got it right, right from the start. But what's really interesting about these burial stones collected by Cabrera and a number of others uh, is the fact that they depict dinosaurs. Here is one of the large stones here in the center of uh, a room he has built for displaying this in the front of his 300 year old mansion. He is a descendant of the conquistadors. This is one of the castles they built and he lives in it. And of course he's, he, was, uh, he passed away in 2002. But looking closely at uh, this stone, you can see the very obvious dinosaur with the dermal frills on its back, a man sitting atop fighting evidently. And then we look at the top of the stone and we see it's ornately covered with, uh, with carvings and uh, a closer view. You see the upper right hand corner, the very obvious sauropod dinosaur with the, the man in his mouth dangling by the foot. Uh, beautifully and artistically done in stone. But there are thousands of these, some 11,000 burial stones have been collected by the Cabreras. Uh, about a third of them are this disgusting pornography, and then about a third of them are of dinosaurs. Uh, here we see most, uh, many of them are shown with man associated, but uh, in battle. Here he's chopping the neck. Uh, in this one, he's already chopped the neck and holding the head in his hand of possibly a juvenile form, but then looks like Mama has got him <laughs> from behind or at least another younger one attacking him and, uh, together with a much larger one on the same stone. Uh, another one here is being bitten as he rides on the back. Uh, notice the variety in styles. This is rather oriental in style. Uh, very different, but uh, obviously very similar. This one's very, uh, you know, maybe literalistic, if you please. Uh, some almost cartoonish. Another oriental style dinosaur. Uh, this beautiful stone is almost four feet tall. Uh, again, very artistically done with the dermal frills on the back, which were written up for the first time in Geology Magazine in uh, 1992, uh, when Mr. Sinclair depicted his dinosaur on the Sinclair dinosaur sign. He didn't know it had dermal frills on the back, but they did down in, uh, in Peru uh, over 2,000 years ago, and uh, here we see them depicted on the stones. It looks like a scene maybe out of Jurassic Park. <laughs> uh, no question about the species that's depicted here. Uh, some rather artistically and stylistically done uh, cartoonish and uh, then very literal. Uh, here are a number of different species depicted on the same stone. Uh, again, a tremendous variety is obvious. One person, again, did not do this.
But this is not the only museum that depicts uh, dinosaurs on the burial stones. Another very interesting display of these stones is seen in the museum there in Inca. It was actually established by Dr. Cabrera over 20 years ago. They have a collection, but they will not display it. We had talked to the brother of Carlos Solti, uh, Pablos, who had donated the collection to the museum uh, uh, about 15 years ago, and uh, we had seen pictures of the stones that he had donated. His brother had excavated them in the 50s uh, near the village of Okakehi, and uh, then donated this to the museum upon the death of his brother. Uh, we went there, said, we want to see this collection. They said, it doesn't exist, that's a myth. We said, we've seen the pictures, we've talked to the one who donated the collection. They said, well, yes, okay, it does exist, but they're in storage and you can't see them. We insisted, saying this is a museum that's not supposed to hide things, it's supposed to show things. They said, well, you can't do this unless you're authorized by an official museum with 48 hours notice. We said, we think we can handle that, and we did. We got a letter from an official state authorized museum authorizing us to examine them. With 48 hours notice, we came back. They still refused. They said, you will not be allowed to examine these. They were stonewalling. Uh, Dr. Swift eventually did gain access last year and got pictures, and yes, they are virtually, well, they are the same as the ones that we see in the Ewell's Rudd collection uh, with dinosaurs on them. Uh, we did get to examine the ones in the collection at the Aeronautical Museum in Lima, pictured here. Uh, years ago, there were many more. They have disappeared over the years. Uh, there were several hundred initially. There are about 40 that remain. But here we see one on the floor in the room where they are displayed, and uh, these are the poorer ones. The better ones have disappeared, but you can still see uh, the dinosaurs on the stones displayed in the Aeronautical Museum uh, in Lima. In the museum in Nazca, likewise, they have some of the carved stones on display. And here we see uh, Dr. Swift <laughs> laboring as he holds up one of the stones for the camera. The stones are exhibited in the Cabrera Museum, where there are 11,000 of them, in the Museum of Inca, where they're hidden, and uh, they wouldn't allow us to see them, uh, Dr. Swift did eventually get, and then Nazca Museum, and the Aeronautical Museum, and the Naval Museum. But we see here the museums which have these stones, all but one of them have them on display that can be seen today. We traveled to the village of Okakehi, where a number of these stones, or at least in the area, where a number of these stones had been excavated in the 50s. Uh, by Carlos Solti, uh, who, is, uh, the, who was the rector of the uh, College of Engineers in Lima. And uh, there we see an obviously very depressed area. Uh, we see individuals who are just eking out a living. Um, Basilio Achua is one of the individuals here who has found a number of these stones and had taken them to Dr. Cabrera. Uh, he took us out to the place where many had been excavated and we could see the actual tombs and see some of the stones in the tombs. As we walked along this desolate area, you could see the bones that had been strewn along the way by the grave robbers who weren't interested in the bones at all, but in the artifacts that they could dig out to sell. Uh, in these tombs, you see amazing preservation, even of flesh parts. Uh, in an area where it hasn't rained for 100 years, uh, the dryness of the desert is excellent for preservation. But in these tombs, you can see the remains of the mummies. This is a trophy head that was worn on the belt by this brutal culture. In one of the nearby museums, you see the skulls with a hole in the head, this means that was a, a trophy head. It had been worn by somebody who had evidently killed them in battle. But as we look at these tombs, we see often babies with mothers. Maybe if the mother died, they couldn't take care of the babies. And uh, I, I don't know the whole story, but it doesn't look like a, a nice story. Uh, here we see one of the well-preserved mummies together with a number of bones that have been found in the area. And in this particular tomb, you see one of the burial stones 
in C2 in place. And you see this uh, on a number of occasions. Here's another one of the burial stones beside one of the mummies uh, with a dinosaur on it. This one was excavated in 2005. The drawing here shows what's seen on it, not as uh, dramatically clear as with some of them, but it can be seen very clearly. It has been examined carefully by a number of laboratories, and we see the close-up of some of the carvings showing the patina uh, in the grooves, also testifying to its antiquity. Uh, this was one that was excavated in 2006 that uh, is in a collection that I own. This is about a 70-pound stone. It has three dinosaurs on it. It was from about 100 miles away from the Paracas Peninsula, and uh, the carving style is slightly different. You can see uh, the teeth are raised uh, rather than incised. Uh, the bias relief is in evidence here, but the same style, uh, again, depicting the dinosaurs. Many say, well, Cabrera uh, was a strange fella, and we can't depend on his testimony. Well, uh, I think he was a very credible witness, but we have many, many different sources. Notice that the first one is the Spanish priest uh, who in 1525 described these stones, and there have been several reports of this. The chronicler of the Incas wrote of these stones in 1570. Uh, in detail, they found the stones with the strange animals on them. And then uh, uh, Bolivia Cabrera, the grandfather, of uh, the one that we worked with there, began collecting the stones in the 30s. And then Javier Cabrera continued the collection uh, amassing some 11,000 of the stones. He was professor of medicine at the University of Lima, head of the Department of Medicine for 20 years. He established the largest teaching hospital in Peru and retired to be cultural anthropologist for Inca. This is not a lightweight in terms of a witness, but if you want to ignore him, there are many others. There's Carlos Solti, who excavated the stones at Ocoquehi in the 50s. Uh, Pablo Solti, who is his brother, donated the stones to the museum in 1968. The museum denied it, promised to show them to us if we met their conditions and then refused, and, but then finally did reveal them. Yes, they have them there. And then Basilio Achua of Okakehi excavated a number of the stones. The Aeronautical Museum displays many of the stones today, as does the Regional Museum in Nazca. Um, I, together with Dr. Swift, have observed them in the tombs, in C2. University of Bonn uh, in Germany has confirmed the oxidized patina in a number of the stones, and grave robbers continue to excavate these carved stones. You can still dig them up. Now, that's an impressive array of confirmation. And if you don't like uh, Dr. Cabrera, then okay, <laughs> toss him out. You still have an impressive array of confirmation. In addition to the stones we find in the tombs, other things that display the dinosaurs, like the textiles, the burial cloths that were associated with them. Many of them show the dinosaur motif, as do the, the vases, uh, the pottery. This is in the National Museum in Lima, under, it has a sign circa 2,500 years before present. Uh, and then the, the Moshi vases, very famous for their style, uh, inability to reproduce them. Uh, they're showing clearly dinosaurs. And then some of the gold death masks that were found up in northern Peru likewise show the dinosaurs. Notice the dermal frills on the back, the huge teeth, the tail curving up over their back on either side of the face here. Uh, it's obvious that the people of Peru we're seeing dinosaurs from their vases and their death masks and their textiles, as well as the thousands of stones that can be seen today. I, I think that's just really irrefutable evidence. While we were there, we interviewed Dr. Cabrera and in the process learned more and more and more of what he was able to reveal. He'd been collecting the burial stones for years. His father had actually begun back in the 30s collecting the burial stones from the Inca tombs. And we were able to actually get into some of the tombs uh, and see some of the uh, in situ uh, burial stones in the, in the tombs uh, and photograph that. 
but he had a collection of some 11,000 of these stones there in the front of his huge mansion, which is on the square there in Enca. It was built by the conquistadors. Uh, he's a descendant, uh, not of the Indians, but of the, the Spanish conquistadors. Um, he uh, is an eminent scientist. Uh, he performed the first heart surgery in Peru, uh, heart transplant. Uh, he was 20 years head of the Department of Medicine at the University of Lima and established uh, the teaching hospital uh, there in Inca and actually uh, established uh, the museum there in Inca, which now they <laughs> Uh, refused to, well, they refused to acknowledge his work there. An interesting story there with the museum because uh, Carlos Solte, who was registrar of the Museum of Engineers in Lima, had also excavated some of these burial stones and then donated them to that museum in Inca. Uh, we interviewed his brother, uh, who said he had, at his brother's death, had. Uh, donated the stones, so we went to the museum, Dr. Swift and I, asked to see them, though they, they don't exist, they, they're not real. And we showed pictures, we knew we, that they were there. Well, okay, they're here, but they're in storage. Uh, well, okay, we're, we're not in a big hurry, we'd like to see them. Well, you have to have an official document from a chartered museum in order to us, for us to give you permission to see them, which was nonsense, but that was a rule he made up on the spot. Fine. It took us two days to get that. We had it faxed from the U.S. and presented it to him, and then he wouldn't even come out to meet us. He sent his assistant out and said, sorry, I don't care if you've got the permit, uh, you've got the, the, the document, we will not allow you to see them. Uh, it was two years later when Dr. Swift did finally get to see them and did examine them himself. They are there, just like what Cabrera has in his museum in the front of his house, huge mansion there. Uh, he has 11,000, in addition, other artifacts that he doesn't show most of the time. Of course, he's passed away, I think, in 2002. He is a very unusual man, obviously a genius. He's got some very unusual ideas. Yeah, he believes in the billions of years, millions of years for dinosaurs, but that man was back millions of years ago and obviously was intelligent because of the depictions on the stones uh, of what appears to be brain surgery and, and heart transplants that he could see on the stones. You could see the uh, some Caesarean uh, births taking place and uh, the operations, the placentia, all depicted on these stones from tombs uh, 1,500 to 2,500 years ago. Uh, and of course he had a great interest in this, not so much in, in the dinosaurs as we were, but more in the technology that he was able to detect in the stones. Uh, we wanted to see the dinosaurs, and about a third of them had dinosaurs on them. All varieties, very specific, uh, not just general variety, but this species and that species. Uh, some of them very large, uh, four or five feet across. Most of them football size, but all, uh, all ranges of sizes, 11,000 of them, about a third of them with dinosaurs, very clear ones. Uh, some had suggested that he carved them all, which, you know, 11,000 seems a little bit like overkill, and what would the head of the medical department for 20 years be doing carving on stones then? It, it just didn't make any sense at all. Besides that, uh, Dr. Swift had uh, done experimentation at the University of Bonn uh, in Germany, found, finding patina in the grooves, uh, doing even carbon-14 on the patina, uh, showing clearly that they were not modern. 
Now, some since then have been carved, but it's very easy. I mean, just a, a school child could see the difference. But we were able to bring some of them back. Uh, it was a museum to museum transfer because it's illegal to bring antiquities out. Likewise in Mexico, we've made a number of trips there in Central Highlands near Acambro in the city, uh, state of Guanajuato. Dr. Swift and I have been down there a number of times investigating. It took that many times to get through all the bureaucracy. When we got there, they were being hidden in the back of the police department. But it was a collection made by uh, Waldemar Yulsrud back in the early 1900s of some 30,000 ceramic figurines, about 10% of which are of dinosaurs, but a wide range of animals and creatures. Some of the brontosaurus type were standing up. We didn't know that until recently. Bacher's book, Dinosaur Heresies, published in 86, was really the first one who suggested that. And then, of course, Spielberg convinced us all they stood up. But this is exactly the way they're rendered by the artist. And these date to well before the time of Christ uh, from several sources. Uh, again, there are thousands of them. And the styles indicate far more than one artist. Uh, one of the professors from the University of Texas at Arlington, who is an art professor, said there were at least 100 different artists represented in the collection, uh, would be his estimate. This is my wife's favorite. Uh, obviously, if you've got one that looks like a dinosaur, a man did it, but sewing them together <laughs> is interesting. Man and dinosaur obviously live together. The, you pick up any of the dinosaur books today, and how does it start out? Millions and millions of years ago. And then the second paragraph says, no man ever saw a dinosaur. And that's just like you can't write a dinosaur book unless you start that way. It ain't so. And there is a great deal of evidence that man and dinosaur did exist at the same time. We want to look at some of that evidence this morning, especially what we find in Acumbro, Mexico. This is an area where we find ceramic dinosaurs from over 3,000 years ago that were excavated in the early 1900s. It's very obvious that these ceramic figurines are of dinosaurs. There are a number of different styles and materials that were used in making them. This is down in Mexico in the Central Highlands in the state of Guanajuato in the city of Acambro. This is a very interesting colonial city with a, a rich history. And in this brochure that advertises the city, we're told that there we find the Chipicoro culture, which was uh, over 3,200 years ago. And it is from that culture that we find these figurines. The culture was actually uh, defined and discovered, or co-discoverer, uh, Waldemar Yulsrud, who immigrated from Germany uh, to Mexico in the uh, early 1900s. He was actually escaping what he saw developing uh, in uh, Germany at that time that he did not appreciate and wanted his boys away from that. And to escape Nazi Germany, came to Mexico. He was a trained archaeologist and uh, became very famous for his work here in Mexico uh, and certainly well known in the city. This is the museum that houses most of the Chipicoro figurines and uh, artifacts and is the museum of the Chipicoro culture in the city. Chipicoro, just about eight uh, kilometers north of Acambro in the same vicinity. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, Waldemar Yulsrud was uh, a prominent resident here of the city and was riding horseback one morning out uh, in the outskirts of town near El Toro. This is a mountain uh, there at the, uh, the edge of the city. And at the base, uh, we find a number of uh, archaeological excavations. He was riding along an irrigation ditch and saw some of the figurines sticking out, stopped and uh, excavated them. And from that found uh, thousands of these and ultimately collected over 30,000, which filled his house. He was uh, consumed with his interest in this culture, and especially the dinosaur figurines. This is the house as it appears today. It's been 
turned into a hardware store, but it's a large mansion that takes up most of a city block. Charles Hapgood uh, actually brought my attention to this. Uh, he's professor of history, or was professor of history and anthropology at the University of New Hampshire. He is now deceased. But he had heard about these and came down to Mexico to investigate. And these are photographs that were taken when he was investigating in the early 50s. And from these photographs, you can see that obviously they're strange creatures, but uh, especially here in the foreground, you see obviously din dinosauran features. And these were from the uh, collection uh, that had been amassed by Waldemir Yultrud over a number of years while he was collecting these. Uh, Hapgood enlisted the aid of Earl Stanley Gardner, who was uh, a friend, uh, obviously uh, very good at investigating mysteries. He was a criminologist. He uh, had been uh, district attorney in the uh, county of Ventura in California for over 30 years and, of course, had written uh, the Perry Mason stories. And he's the author of uh, those famous TV movies as well as many, many books. He's referred to on the website that describes him as the world's most famous lawyer. He wrote a book about this mystery called The Host with the Big Hat. The same author that wrote Perry Mason described this mystery and his investigation of it. Uh, obviously, it's controversial uh, because it describes the coexistence of humans and dinosaurs, and some scientists would just dismiss it outright because of the philosophical implications, not because of the actual evidence. This would fly in the face of evolutionary theory, and so no matter who it is or how much evidence, they're not going to accept it. Here we see a picture of Professor Hapgood, Earl Stanley Gardner, together with Carlos Yulesrud, who was the son of Waldemir Yulesrud, and they worked together to try to solve this mystery and to prove that uh, the father, Waldemir Yulesrud, was not the one who manufactured these, which is what the critics were saying. 33,000 figurines, <laughs> a variety of styles and materials, uh, just mind-boggling array, uh, all from one individual was the, I think, ridiculous claim. But Earl Stanley Gardner was invest, uh, enlisted to help uh, investigate this and to prove it. And here we see him looking closely at some of these figurines. And he has pictures of them in his book. Here is one of the pictures from his book. And we notice the title, which says that dinosaurs do appear abundantly throughout the collection. He interviewed at length Carlos, the son of Waldemar Yulesrud, who had uh, gone out with his father to excavate on a number of occasions and had found numbers of these things uh, while he was uh, working with his father. He also uh, here is seen interviewing uh, Professor Hapgood, and the two of them worked together. And notice in his book the description of the work that was done to refute the idea that uh, Waldemar Yulesrud was the author, the manufacturer, the source of <clears throat> these dinosaur figurines. Uh, here, quoting from Earl Stanley Gardner, Professor Hapgood lay awake at night trying to devise new tests, new places to dig. He even went to a road which had apparently been undisturbed for many years, and by many years he's referring to hundreds of years. He dug under the road with permission from the government and sure enough, found the Yulesrud type figurines under the road. He continues saying, in many places in Mexico, boundary lines between fields are marked by stone walls, which are hundreds of years old. And he goes on to describe excavation under these walls, where again, they found examples of the Yulesrud type figurines, including dinosaurs. And then an amazing, <laughs> just ingenious, uh, test was proposed uh, together with the chief of police of Acambaro. Uh, his house had been built some 50 years before Jules Rudd immigrated from Germany. It was one of the original houses. Adobe brick was the construction material. He said, let's dig under the house of the police chief, under the living room floor. And if these figurines are found there, then obviously Jules Rudd would not be the source of this material. 
And so they did that. Here we see the mayor uh, standing in attention. He also conducted a three-month investigation into the possibility that maybe someone had manufactured these, questioning people throughout the area uh, for any knowledge of uh, anyone manufacturing such figurines. When you fire them, uh, it would be known. Here we see a brick factory right at the base of El Toro, where many of them were found. When you fire the brick, you make smoke, and uh, especially when you're burning wood, which would be the source of the fire, the material to, to fire them. And uh, you can't do this without being known. And in a three-month investigation, the police chief found no evidence that they had been manufactured recently. In uh, the book, Host with the Big Hat, Earl Stanley Gardner pictures here uh, a diagram of the police chief's house. And there under the floor, uh, it's pointed out that 43 pieces of the Yules Rudd uh, figurines were found under the floor of the police chief <laughs> of the city of Acomboro. Uh, and so he continues to describe the investigation, saying, we had our cameras with us and took pictures, particularly of the weathered adobe bricks with the various fragments cemented firmly in place. These adobe bricks originated 50 years before Yules Rudd arrived on the scene. And in the brick, embedded in them, you can see the pieces of the figurines and the pieces of pottery from the Chipicoro culture. He continues saying, we scratched around enough on the cut bank of Bull Hill, or El Toro, to see that the soil was liberally studded with artifacts. And then he has pictures of these artifacts in the brick. Uh, Obviously, Yules Rudd didn't do this, and then concludes, and this is a very flat-footed statement for a criminologist, a careful scientist to make. He says, it is absolutely, positively out of the question to think that these artifacts, which he saw, could have been planted. Now, that's Perry Mason, or Earl Stanley Gardner's conclusion. He proved it. In, in, in his mind, there was no question but that these certainly go back much further than Earl Stanley Gardner. We didn't really know what dinosaurs looked like before the 1900s or didn't know that well. We had a, a very poor view and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, but further testing was done by these two men, Hapgood and Gardner. Uh, radiocarbon dates uh, were obtained, submitted by Professor Hapgood to Isotopes Incorporated in New Jersey. And uh, sample number one was about 3,500 years, and then 6,400 years, and then uh, 3,000 years. And so there was a significant range. But if these are over 200 years, they are before we knew anything about dinosaurs. And they're supposed to have been gone then for 65 million years. Well, 6,000, 3,000, 2,000, <laughs> probably just over 3,000 years ago. Uh, we have figurines. They were also submitted by Professor Hapgood to the University of Pennsylvania Museum Testing Facility for thermoluminescent dating, which is probably the most appropriate dating system for pottery. Uh, we won't go into great detail about how that works, uh, but it's, it's a different type system and particularly suited for pottery. Sample number one came back about 2500 BC uh, and then number two and number three and number four all right on the same date, 2500, very consistently. Uh, and this would logically be the most reasonable conclusion for the date. Obviously, these labs are going to come under scrutiny for putting out such material. And that was the case here. Nevertheless, uh, Dr. Rainey, who's director of the Pennsylvania Museum, issued a statement regarding this. Uh, defending his conclusion. He said, we've had years of experimentation both here and at the lab at Oxford. We have no doubt at all about the dependability of the thermoluminescent method. I should also point out, he continues, that we were so concerned about the extraordinarily ancient date of these figurines that Mark Hahn and our lab made an average of 18 runs on each one of the four samples. Four samples, 18 runs on each one, because this, this is extraordinary information. 
and uh, <laughs> they still continue to get the same consistent dates. Uh, he continues then saying, all in all, the lab stands on these dates for the Jules Rudd, mater Jules Rudd material, whatever this means in terms of archaeological dating in Mexico or in terms of the fake versus authentic pieces. The lab takes the stand because they were extraordinarily cautious and made 18 runs on four samples. Well, they took even greater flack when this letter came out and three months later he withdrew it without giving any reason at all. Uh, I think I know exactly why he withdrew it, but he certainly was not because of empirical evidence. It was because of the philosophical pressure of his peers. With such information, I was intrigued. What, uh, what is the, the truth? What is the, the, the answer to this mystery in Acombero? I went down with uh, Dr. Dennis Swift to personally investigate this material. Uh, we were there in uh, 1999 twice, uh, and then in 2000, and actually we've, <laughs> we've made about a dozen trips now. When we first got there, this is the scene that depicts where they were, and uh, actually they were locked in, in this door that you see in the background, behind that door with a padlock in the back of the police department. Uh, they were hoping nobody would find out about it. They were hidden and had been there for about 30 years. Um, why? Well, this is an embarrassment. You're not supposed to find evidence of humans and dinosaurs, and they wanted to appear uh, intelligent. And it took a great deal of effort to get that door open. But we finally did, and uh, with uh, uh, pressure, actually, from outside sources, uh, political pressure, we were able to examine two of the 60 crates of materials that were stored behind that door the first time that we came down. And sure enough, even in just the two crates, which is a random sampling of over 60, uh, we found strange ceramic figurines, including figurines of dinosaurs. The second time we came down, we were able to e examine more crates, still not all of them. But here we have a number of them spread out on the table. Dr. Swift is actually mocking the, the great security with which these were guarded. They had a soldier there with an AK-47 guarding us, and as we looked at these figurines, he grabbed it from him and posed with the figurines. But uh, they had been, of course, under lock and key. Nobody could see them, but uh, with our investigation, we finally brought them to light and were able to make uh, a photographic uh, record of a number of these. We see in this picture uh, an, an amazing variety uh, both of ethnicity and styles and materials that are reflected in these figurines. Of the 33,000, about 2,600 of them are of dinosaurs, and I think you can see that very obviously here. Uh, one amazing thing uh, about the sauropod types is that many of them were shown standing upright. We didn't know about this, until Robert Bacher told us this in Dinosaur Heresies, in his book 1986, but it looks like he had one of the Acombero figurines shown here on the right as a model for what he illustrated in his book Dinosaur Heresies. Of course, then Spielberg convinced us all that they, they stood upright, but 3,000 years ago, uh, obviously they knew that down in Acombero. Now this is what uh, we thought dinosaurs looked like way back in about 1850. This is supposed to be a picture of an iguanodon, one of the earliest dinosaurs that were excavated. Well, that's not very close, but that's what we thought in 1850. By the turn of the century, this was 1895, we had him depicted differently, kind of a stand-up alligator with a long tail dragging the floor. Not very accurate, but closer. But now then we know that Iguanodon looked like this. This is a restoration from uh, the year 2000. So now we've got a pretty good idea. Notice the almost horse-like head and the, the tail that sticks out right. The ossified tendons along the tail show that it was uh, stood out right like a bird. Uh, if it drooped to the ground, that meant it was broken. But notice how the people in Acombero uh, depicted this over 3,000 years ago, just almost identical to what we now have finally learned. 
This is the way they looked when we first started in the 1800s, 1900s, but now then we know it looks like this and the folks in Acambaro got it right 3,000 years ago as they did with the, the stand-up sauropods. Another figurine appears uh, to look just like the ankylosaur that we see depicted here. <laughs> very, very similar. Uh, there's a wide range. I suppose sauropods are the most popular, but 2,600 of these that I've examined, I have 20,000 digital image, images that I personally took of this collection. We've examined it carefully. Here are flying pterosaurs and uh, a totally different style, different materials, uh, obviously a different artist. Um, some of the critics have said, well, it's all made by the same fella uh, in a short period of time, uh, to, to, and the, the numbers were to impress people. 30, uh, 33,000 is, is kind of overkill, isn't it? And certainly there's a tremendous variety of styles and materials not made out of the same stuff as is obvious to an objective observer, uh, but a bewildering array of mysterious creatures. What in the world were these for? Uh, I think the most reasonable explanation is that they were apropopatic. This is a, a fancy word that archeologists use, uh, actually coined from the investigations over in Mesopotamia where they found caches of these buried under the threshold of dwellings or where dwellings had been. And we find these often in caches of 20 uh, up to 30 in, uh, packed in sand, surrounded of course by the clay soil. And it would appear that they were buried carefully. Some have suggested maybe the enemies were coming and they buried their gods, their idols. Uh, to protect them from the invasion, I strongly suspect they were like the apropopatic uh, figurines in Mesopotamia that were buried under the threshold to ward off evil spirits. And that's what this fancy word means. It's to, to scare off the evil spirits. Well, if you're going to scare off spirits, I suppose dinosaur figurines would be as efficient as any. Uh, but the bottom line, we don't know. These are several different ideas that have been proposed. It's interesting to lo notice again that 20, in 2600 you've got a tremendous variety and the association with people seems to be uh, closer and more, uh, uh, more frequent with the juvenile forms. I think I can understand that I mean, if you watch Jurassic Park, but some of the juvenile forms are depicted uh, you know, they're kind of cute and uh, uh, we can see why uh, humans might be more closely associated with with these forms. We also find, besides dinosaurs, other uh, uh, out of place figurines. Here is a horse. This is typical of the Pleistocene horse, Ice Age, uh, which wasn't supposed to be in Mexico till the Spaniards brought the horses. Uh, here is another one that uh, is with a man trying to ride it uh, who has lost his head. It's broken in this figurine. But uh, an amazing turn of events involves the, the find of the unfossilized tooth of a Pleistocene horse associated with the Pleistocene horse itself. This tooth was identified by George Gaylord Simpson of Harvard, who is uh, the leading expert on fossil horses, uh, was the leading expert in the world. Well, here is the Pleistocene horse. Here is the Pleistocene tooth unfossilized found with it. Uh, the mystery deepens, or at least maybe <laughs> the, the picture contrary to the standard evolutionary picture is, uh, is getting more difficult. Uh, we went back to try to verify Gardner's research. I think he did an excellent job. We thought, well, let's just look and see if we can repeat what he did and uh, re-verify. Uh, we wanted to do original excavations. And we approached this with uh, some of the leading experts to get permits. And permits have to be obtained from ENA. This is the Institute of uh, Archaeology there in Mexico. And we applied three different times with the University of Texas first, and then with uh, David Soleil, who at the time was director of the Museum of the Rockies. 
He's actually Jack Horner's boss. Jack Horner is the individual, if you saw Jurassic Park, the real life character that uh, it, it, who the story is based on. He's the, the fellow I represented just digging up dinosaurs up in Montana. Well, his boss, the director of Museum of the Rockies, David Soleil, went with us and we applied together for permits and they were all denied. And we were told firmly, actually the mayor of Acombero was told that we would never be given a permit that uh, the implications would not be allowed. Actually, we found out that Ina had done their own investigation back in 1953. They sent four archaeologists to Acombro to do official excavations there. They chose their own site over a mile away from Yulesrud site, and they found figurines, a number of them, six feet down, including dinosaurs, and acknowledged that the figurines were authentic, but not so with the dinosaurs, which were found in the same place by them at the same time, at the same level, together. They couldn't be, and uh, we actually intercepted the interdepartmental memo, and we have exactly what they said about this, and this is from a memo dated February 24th, 1954. Apparently, those artifacts were gathered scientifically, but even so, they are reproductions of relatively recent times, and they're talking here about the dinosaurs. Uh, in our opinion, it is impossible that man existed at the same time as those saurian that lived millions of years ago. So they're acknowledging, yes, they are dinosaur figurines, but they could not have been with man, and so they just simply deny it. Continuing, they say it's our opinion in our opinion, the only archaeological artifacts are the collections of vessels and other Chipiquero pieces that they found at the same time. These are authentic and represent great archaeological value for our study. So in the same hole at the same time, <laughs> they found authentic ones, but dinosaurs with them couldn't be, and so they just deny it. That's why it is the philosophical pressure that says you cannot have humans and dinosaurs together, that would destroy the picture of evolution that's in the textbooks. And so here's what's real and here's what's not, not based on the evidence, but based on the philosophical conclusions. We brought an expert down to examine these. This is uh, Jim Collins, who is with the University of Texas. He's art instructor, a ceramics expert, and he found a, a number of things about these uh, figurines that we didn't know. For instance, uh, he found many, or most of them, were actually double fired. Some had wondered how such fragile figurines could be uh, maintained intact in the earth all of these years. And of course, if you go to the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, you'll see dozens uh, of similar figurines that remained intact, which they don't question. But these have been double fired. These people uh, were rather sophisticated in their technique. And of course, somebody just making fakes by the thousands wouldn't go to this kind of trouble. Uh, you can see that some of them were broken and where they are, you can see evidence of this slip on the outside that is uh, a sophisticated pottery technique. This is compared with the broken piece from the National Museum of Anthropology and compares favorably with it, actually better fired than this uh, excellent piece. We went back to the house that the police chief owned uh, under which Earl Stanley Gardner had uh, excavated 43 pieces of Yules Rudd type material and found that it had been covered with modern brick now in modern times and that was somewhat disappointed. We wanted to see the adobe brick. We did look across the street, and sure enough, there it had not been covered by modern brick. The adobe brick was still obvious, and as we looked carefully here, uh, Professor Collins is looking closely at those brick, and you can see, yes, as Earl Stanley Gardner said, they are studded with the pottery pieces from the Chipiquero culture, and that's obvious, and as we look carefully at one of the bricks, this is directly across the street from the house of the police chief, where Earl Stanley Gardner investigated. In one of those bricks, lo and behold, there's a dinosaur sticking his face out. And if you listen very carefully, you can hear him say, na 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 <laughs> just making a mockery of the idea that man and humans have to be millions of years apart. 
Uh, these brick done 50 years before Ewell's Rudd arrived contained pieces of the uh, ancient Chipiquero culture which were scattered in the clay and scooped up and uh, used to, to make brick, not intentionally taking the fragments, but you just can't scoop up the material without getting some of them in it. Let's go back and look carefully at some of the witnesses who have testified to the fact that they helped Yulzrud excavate these and that these were parts of uh, what was found from original excavations. One of the more credible witnesses, I believe, would be the grandson of Walter Yulzrud. He is uh, a rather well-known contractor uh, in the area. Uh, he is uh, well-to-do, well-educated. He's standing here beside the grave of his grandfather, testifying about going out and excavating these figurines with him. We have uh, uh, about 20 minutes of recorded testimonies with him standing right there by the grave, telling of the figurines that he helped his father excavate. Uh, this is one of the ones that he had in his uh, very nice home there uh, in Lyon. And here, uh, this, this is a beautiful dinosaur of the sauropod type that he personally excavated with his grandfather. We also found as we investigated uh, and talked to a number of witnesses that El Toro was not the only site where dinosaurs were found. On the opposite side of the city, the north side, you find El Chivo. Goat Mountain, and at the base of this mountain there was a lake and a site where ancient Chipiquero people had uh, had made dwellings, and uh, you can see places where the the dwellings were there uh, between the lake site and the bottom of the hill, and I was taken there by uh, an individual, uh, Mr. Espinosa, who is now an accountant there in Acambaro who as a teenager went with uh, Waldemar Yulzrud. He had enlisted several of the young people to go with him to help him dig and to help him carry back the materials that they found. And he took me to the spot. He said, here is where we dig, where we dug, and here is the type of thing we found. He drew sketches of the materials. A very credible witness. And then we have Dr. Hineon who is uh, actually a hero in Acambaro, or at least uh, I, I would describe him as such. Several did to me. Uh, he has a medical practice in, uh, in Guadalajara, uh, several miles away, but he comes back on the weekends to help the poor people of Acambaro. Uh, their culture, their, their, their economy is not nearly so thriving, and many of them are poor. And he practices medicine there in Acambaro, free of charge, to help those who are poor. He could run for mayor and win hands down. He's not interested in that. He's interested in helping people. But he told us that he was one of the ones who went with Yulzrud to excavate these. He excavated them uh, with him underground that was hard packed, covered with grass and with cactus. And uh, on one occasion, they got literally two big sacks, these uh, uh, what we would call toe sacks, uh, burlap sacks. Uh, full of these figurines in one trip, put them on the back of a burrow and came back. A uh, very credible witness uh, who is certainly willing to affirm that this is the case even today. And then we have uh, Mr. Martinez, who was formerly chief of the federal police in the area just uh, about 10 years earlier when this picture was taken. He is now retired. Uh, and he is uh, an interesting, uh, he tells an interesting story because he actually confiscated over 3,000 of these figurines from two individuals who were illegally excavating at El Chivo. They had found where a number of these were buried and they were just digging up a storm in the middle of the night and selling them across the border and he caught them and put them in the federal penitentiary. They were convicted of dealing in illegal artifacts. And so the federal government decided these were real, authentic antiquities and put them in jail. He said among these artifacts that they had excavated were, were dinosaurs, and he drew sketches of several of them. Uh, they were then added to the Yulzrud collection, which is there in Acambaro still today. Uh, but 
some people will say, well, Yulzrud was the source of all of these. Well, we, we can prove they were there before Yulzrud. We can prove they were excavated after Yulzrud. And the federal government actually helped us verify that by convicting these people who had excavated them there at El Chivo uh, and uh, are now doing time for that crime. Then we have uh, Mr. Perel, very interesting individual. He was uh, former director of archaeology of the Camaro Zone of the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, the largest anthropological museum in the world. At the time Yulzrud was in the Camaro, he was uh, the director of archaeology for the area, and it was his job to verify and to authenticate the finds. And he and Yulzrud were actually antagonists. They didn't get along well at all because Yulzrud didn't go to the trouble of getting permits most of the time. And uh, he would uh, complain and uh, threaten to put him in jail, and uh, they fussed and fought all the time. But he saw the figurines that Yulzrud excavated. Furthermore, the farmers at the time continually found such figurines, and he was called in to authenticate and verify. He said he saw hundreds of them excavated by farmers that Yulzrud had nothing to do with. Many of them took them to Yulzrud, uh, who would often pay the farmers just a small fee to help increase his collection. He worked with Ramon Pinochon, who is perhaps the most famous archaeologist in Mexico history. He was 20 years uh, president of the National Museum of Anthropology, uh, again, the largest anthropological museum in the world. And they particularly worked together on a dig at Chapicuro uh, in the 1940s, uh, where they were getting ready to flood the area, putting up a dam, and had to move some of the tombs, the graves, of the ancient Chapicuro sites. And here we see a picture of uh, that dig with uh, an early picture of Ramon Pinochon and Beatrice, his wife, whom he met on that trip and married. She became an archaeologist and uh, is still an archaeologist serving in one of the museums there in Mexico City today. We found the uh, permit from Ina, which uh, authorized this dig. We found the notes. This is actually in the museum in Chapicuro of the dig, and they have displayed a couple of the pictures. Uh, I took this picture of some of the artifacts that came from that dig, uh, supervised by Ramon Pinochon. Mr. Perea, who was there, representing the museum at the time, he was the director of that area, worked with them. He says, in this tomb, this, the ones in this picture, they found a dinosaur. That is not a figurine, but an actual dinosaur that was about 30 feet long. He said it had the short little front feet and the huge long legs, about three foot head with the huge teeth. We have his recorded testimony, about two hours of a detailed description of exactly what they found. He said, Ramon Pinochon took pictures of this. He has the pictures. Well, that pricked our ears up. Uh, Ramon Pinochon had been dead about two years at that time, but his wife, we suspected, would have the pictures. We went to her. She said, yes, I had them. I've seen the pictures. Uh, I have donated them to Ina, the Institute of Archaeology. Uh, well, that was disappointing because they had stonewalled our effort to get permits. But she called them at our request, asked them to allow uh, us to examine these photographs. We got in the cab, we went immediately to the Institute of Archaeology, walked in the door. The supervisor there who met us recognized me in my previous attempts to get permits, and he said, no, you cannot see them. He had promised Beatrix Pinochon that uh, we would be allowed, but he says, I don't care what I promised, you can't see them. This was a stone wall. Uh, we've run into this several times. That information is there, it's being covered up. Uh, interestingly, in association with that, we found this picture of Waldemar Yulzrud, which is in the museum there today, uh, the Yulzrud Museum, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, and here he's standing with a large dinosaur bone. In his book, Enigmas of the Past, uh, he describes finding, uh, partially buried, a dinosaur with uh, fresh bones, that is, unfossilized, and here he's standing there with one of those bones. And we took the picture to some experts to see if they, they could identify that. 
Uh, and here we see Brooks Britt uh, of the Department of Geology at Brigham Young University uh, making the comment, the large bone appears to be a sauropod rib. That's, and so we find the tooth from the horse, uh, we find the sauropod rib, we find the testimony of a buried dinosaur from uh, Mr. Pena, who, who was director uh, of the uh, Institute of Archaeology there for the Combro Zone, uh, or at least the Museum of Archaeology for the Combro Zone, all testifying that there were dinosaurs not too long ago, uh, unfossilized remains. As we look at the incredible variety of styles and materials and subjects of the 33,000 figurines, it's just mind-boggling. I think we're looking at a pig here, maybe. Uh, probably a pig here, but this wasn't made by the same fellow. This is a totally different style. And maybe that's a pig, but certainly very, very different. Possibly we're looking at a dog here. Uh, another one here with his master that looks a lot like Chewbacca. <laughs> uh, here's, uh, I guess, a bird rather stylistically done and another totally different bird. But the array of styles is just uh, mind-boggling. Uh, Dr. Uh, or Professor Collins estimated there were at least a hundred different artists that were involved in producing this vast array. It's interesting to no notice the, the uh, variety of ethnicity that's represented. This appears to be an Egyptian uh, motif uh, from some of the figurines, again from the collection. And many of them are very oriental in style, as you can see here. And some of them are very African in style. Uh, it seems undeniable that these have an African appearance, while others are, are very European. Again, from 3,000 years ago. Notice the very uh, artistically done dinosaur here compared with a totally different style, not done by the same artist. And I don't know who did that, maybe somebody with a, a nightmare that got scared to death by them. But certainly different styles. Here's a rather stylistic, uh, artistically done dinosaur, very different. Some of them almost cartoonish. Uh, Again, totally different styles, different materials, uh, obviously different artists, but a vast array. Uh, and as we look at the general configuration, is there any doubt what's being depicted here? Uh, they had to have been seeing the dinosaurs uh, some 3,000 years ago. And here's just example after example. This Diplodocus type looks like it stepped out of a Spielberg movie. Uh, again, if you know dinosaurs, you recognize immediately some of these forms, and though some of them are uh, cartoonish and stylistically done, uh, there's no question as to what we're looking at. Here's the Stegosaurus. This is another one, but a different artist did this one in a totally different style. Again, one after another, you see <laughs> unquestionable resemblance. Many of them uh, were in the form of pendants uh, with a hole in the center they wore around their neck, again, lending credibility to the idea these were to scare off the evil spirits. Uh, but we saw literally dozens of these, and many of the figures of the people could be seen with these pendants uh, sculpted in, in the figurine. Man with dinosaur. How do you <laughs> avoid the conclusion? Many of them are seen fighting. Sometimes the man's getting the best of the fight and sometimes the dinosaur, and usually with smaller ones. Uh, we would assume more juvenile forms. Here the, the dinosaur is getting the best of him. Uh, many times with the, the juvenile forms, as you can see, some of them still uh, showing uh, some ferocity even as juveniles. But uh, the depiction of them fighting together here, the dinosaur getting the best, and here the man getting the best shows the kind of conflict that very likely was going on at this time. Here's one with a spear in his neck, but uh, very closely resembling uh, our modern knowledge of what dinosaurs look like. Uh, this one is my wife's favorite. <laughs> um, we could go on and on and on, 2,600 of them. 
On a recent trip to Mexico, we made additional discoveries here at the foot of El Toro. Actually, we didn't do the digging, but this was done by an individual who was digging clay for bricks. He has his own brick factory and permits to uh, take clay from this area, right at the foot of El Toro, not far from where Jules Rudd had done his excavations. And he showed us a number of the beautiful vases and figures that he had gotten from the area. And uh, one of them was extremely interesting. Uh, this dinosaur type creature is very similar to the Bullosaurus, depicted here by Romer. Uh, a, a very obvious similarity, but again, the dermal frills along the back are typical of the, uh, the dinosaur type. And uh, a number like this were found, and this was done, of course, <laughs> Uh, in, in the, about the year 2000, 2002, 2003, uh, continuing the excavation, he continues to find these long, long after Yultrud, of course, has passed away. They continue to be excavated in spite of uh, Ina's strong effort to keep us from doing that. We can't or uh, we would be in jail because we don't have the permits but he did have a permit to get them for his brick factory, or at least to get the clay. Now then, these uh, figurines are housed in the Waldemar Yulesrud Museum there in Acombro. When we arrived on the scene, they were locked in the back of the police department. <laughs> uh, as we began to tell them the significance and began to present the evidence and show how they had been verified, uh, from, from various sources, they decided this was significant information and in spite of Ina's opposition, they put up a museum and they're very prominently and, and uh, very professionally displayed and you can go to a Combero and see these and hear the story of Waldemar Yulesrud and see some of the pictures that we've shown you. Uh, we see the director of the museum today on the left, uh, together with the wife of an archaeologist who has helped us there, Dr. Swift and myself in front of the museum in a picture taken, res taken recently. Now, let's summarize the evidence. There is the radiometric dating, which helps us understand, especially with a variety of examples for a few thousand years. Uh, radiocarbon first, uh, according to Hapgood, some three to 6,000 years, and then thermoluminescent dating that was consistently at about 4,000 years, or 2,500 BC. And then also uh, a recent radiocarbon dating was done by Neil Steedy, which indicated 1.5 to 4,000, uh, a range. Uh, but still, if you have it more than 200 years, <laughs> again, you have uh, the, the destruction of the story that's told in the textbooks. Looking at the witnesses and summarizing, there's Waldemar Yulesrud, who was co-discoverer of the Chipiquaro culture, collected over 37,000 artifacts, wrote the book, Enigmas del Pasado, or uh, Mysteries of the Past. Carlos Yulesrud, his son, who also described excavating dinosaurs with his father. And then the grandson, Carlos Yulesrud, who described excavating dinosaurs with his grandfather and recorded that testimony beside his grandfather's tomb and showed us examples that he'd excavated. There is Dr. Hineon, physician Guadalajara, that described his excavations with Yulesrud as a youth and sketched some of the dinosaurs that he found. There is Mr. Espinoza, who is an accountant, uh, who personally took us to the site where he had excavated and also sketched dinosaurs that he had found. There is Pere uh, Carlos Perea, who was former director of archaeology of the Acombero Zone of the National Museum of Anthropology, who described excavations with Ramon Pinachan, uh, dinosaurs and humans together. And then there's Charles Hapgood, professor of history of anthropology at the University of New Hampshire. He excavated dinosaur figurines under roads, uh, helped excavate under the house of the police chief and uh, under walls, stone walls that had been there for hundreds of years and wrote the book, Mystery of Acombro, detailing his investigation. Uh, together with Earl Stanley Gardner, the famous author of Perry Mason, a criminologist, a district attorney uh, in the Los Angeles area for 30 years, uh, proved, I think beyond any shadow of a doubt, he certainly claimed so, uh, that the figurines predated Yulesrud beyond any shadow of a doubt. 
And then there's the mayor of Acambaro, uh, who worked together with Earl Stanley Gardner and conducted his own three-month investigation for fraud, trying to find anyone who had might know, knew anything about manufacturing these things and allowed the excavation under his floor. There's Mr. Marinas, number 10, <laughs> who was the chief of federal police. Uh, Guadalajara confiscated uh, over 3,000 of these figurines from two who were excavating illegally. Uh, including dinosaurs in the collection and sketched those for us. Now that's a huge collection of witnesses. If you were in court trying to refute the testimony of such individuals, you'd be in serious trouble. There's Walter Mariusrud, there is Carlos the son, there is again Carlos the grandson, there's Dr. Henion, there is the accountant, Mr. Espinoza, there is Carlos Perea, the director of the Acambaro Zone for the National Museum, there's Charles Hapgood of the University of New Hampshire, there's Earl Stanley Gardner, Arthur Perry Mason, the mayor of the city, and then the chief of the federal police. That's an impressive array of witnesses and they all testify to the authenticity of these figurines that Yulesrud certainly was not the author, they were there long before he was. I think the conclusion is absolutely inescapable that humans and dinosaurs live together. The only opposition, the only problem, the only reason that's not just really obvious and accepted without question is the philosophical implication. Um, what about like the Yakimbero figurines and who's running that deal, why that's... That, that's a very interesting story, it's a long story. Uh, when Dr. Swift and I arrived, um, we had heard stories, we had seen pictures, uh, <clears throat> but when we got there, they denied it. And we kept prodding and talking to people who had seen them and who had helped uh, Waldemar Yulesrud back in the 30s dig these things up. And uh, we, there were people still alive who had worked with him when they were teenagers. And they told us about them. And, they were there in town. Finally, we found out they were locked away in the back of the police department. Well, we want to see them. Well, the fellow with the key is gone. He won't be back for two days. I said, well, I'll be here for two days. <laughs> or I've got a crowbar. I can fix this. <laughs> Finally, we got him to open the door. But of the 66 crates of figurines that they had stored, they allowed it, they said, all right, we'll let you look at two. And we got those two out and photographed them and there were several dinosaurs amongst the wide variety of animals depicted and photographed that. We had to wait till the following year to come back with correspondence with the mayor. And finally the mayor gave permission for us to get them out and to examine them, which we were able to do. And then in conversation with the mayor, we said, now look, Spielberg has convinced us that the world loves dinosaurs. This is controversial. What does that mean? That means you're going to get news coverage. People are going to hear about it. This is wonderful. You can be Dinosaur City. What's your most opportunistic uh, industry here? The, the tourism. Uh, this is a great climate. It's the same latitude as Hawaii. Have them come see the dinosaurs. Uh, and he, that caught on. Uh, we now have a a museum, I think they spent uh, $150,000 of the city's money and got some other grants and they've got them on display there in a Combro today. And you can see the whole story and pictures of Walter Murray Rudd who excavated them back in the 30s. They've been uh, dated with thermoluminescent dating back to uh, approximately 4,000 years ago. Uh, that's the, the, the most appropriate dating method for pottery. Uh, some have dated them with radiocarbon, which is really not appropriate for pottery, but there may be some particles of carbon there. They came out uh, some two to 3,000 years of age, but of course we've known what dinosaurs looked like for a little over 100 years, so if they're 200 years old, they have a serious problem when they're just beautiful clay ceramic representations of very specific dinosaurs uh, from 4,000 years ago, and there are thousands of them. There's some 33,000 figurines in the collection, uh, over 20,000, about 2,600 of them 
were dinosaurs from 4,000 years ago. There are still dinosaurs being excavated. We interviewed one of the fellows here. Uh, it's been about four years now, but he owned the bread company there. He also owned a brick factory. And he was getting the clay for his brick from an area very close to where Ulsrud had excavated. And he uncovered several caches of the pottery and these figurines, and one of them was one of the most beautiful dinosaurs I've ever seen. Just a, a perfect specimen. That was excavated four years ago. Wow. What's, what's the evolutionary spin in the museum there? Oh, what did, what did well, they say? Well, Ulsrud made them all himself. <laughs> That's what they say when you go in the yeah. museum? He just car he made all uh, these? Very interesting uh, uh, side light here. Uh, Perry Mason, <laughs> Earl Stanley Gardner, the author of Perry Mason, heard about this, was very interested. And he, together with Professor Hapgood, University of New Hampshire, went down to investigate. Well, he's a trained criminologist, uh, Earl Stanley Gardner. And he, he, he knows how to investigate things. And he was saying, all right, if these things were made by yours, right, we ought to be able to find some evidence or falsify that. Let's see if we can dig in places where it wouldn't have been possible for him to make them. The police chief had a house that was built in 1875. Yours right arrived in the early 1900s. Okay, let's excavate under the floor of the police chief, <laughs> the most reputable fellow there. They found 43 specimens under the floor, and he documented that, and Earl Stanley Gardner did in his book, uh, The Host with the Big Hat. There were also walls uh, that had been there for over 300 years, roads that had been there for, and these were places he chose to excavate, and in each place found specimens, totally making it impossible to say, you also did this. And that's documented in his book, Host of the Big Hat, by Earl Stanley Gardner, Perry Mason. <laughs> so argue with him if you want to. And so that's totally ignored by the museum. It just says Waldemar Gell's Red Card all these periods. Well, the museum there in Combro is presenting them as real. Now, uh, you go to the Institute of Archaeology, Ina, in downtown Mexico City, it's all a fraud. They in 1954 sent four archaeologists to a Combro to investigate. The Institute of Archaeology did. They decided to do their own excavation. They chose their own spot about a mile from where Ewell's Rudd had found his. I think they were trying to dig where they weren't. <laughs> and they dug and found them. Down six feet they found a lot of pottery which they acknowledged to be real thousands of years old, Chipiquero culture, uh, about three to 4,000 years ago. Uh, and they found dinosaurs with them in the same place. And the memo that they wrote, and we have a copy of the memo, was that this pottery is real, but that the dinosaurs could not be because man and dinosaurs didn't live together. And they dug it up themselves in a spot they chose. Now that was 1954, so they know, and that's why they never would give us a permit. Uh, we went down with three times to, to try to get permits, met every criteria. We actually had the application made by the uh, director of the Museum of the Rockies. Uh, that's the fellow who was the boss of Jack Horner at the time, the famous archaeologist that was featured in Jurassic Park. His boss went with us, and he signed the application. He made the application through the uh, museum. And we also made an application through University of Texas, one of the professors there. Now, turned it all down, would not allow. They knew what was there. They would found it themselves. They wouldn't let us do it. So, well, we were in France uh, just a couple of years ago and found dinosaurs all over the place. I was lecturing on coexistence of humans and dinosaurs, the footprints and several of the evidences, like the 
uh, the burial stones and the Acambro figurines. A young lady in the audience said that she had just returned from France with her senior trip and she had been to one of the castles there and she saw a dinosaur carved on the side of the castle. Well, uh, Carl and I have found that about one out of 20 stories that we heard <laughs> turn out to be anything. So we were a little skeptical. Uh, and that may be an optimistic description. Uh, but I, she's a very devout young lady, and, I, I li and she said, I think I have a picture of it. Okay. Uh, and sure enough, the next Sunday here she came and she had the picture. And there was a picture of a dinosaur that was, she says, carved on the wall of the castle. Okay, I need to go see this. So we uh, got uh, Vance Nelson and uh, together he's a creationist up in Canada and we traveled. And not only was there a dinosaur there, there were 800 dinosaurs carved on this castle, Chateau de Chambord down toward the south of France. Uh, supposed to be a hunting lodge. Uh, what were they hunting? <laughs> they got dinosaurs carved all over the side of it. Uh, and then we found Chateau de Bois, which was not that far away. Also had similar dinosaurs. Looks like a Plateosaurus primarily. But then there were others as well. There were tapestries on the wall. Uh, just obvious uh, duckbill type dinosaurs, uh, dramatically represented on the tapestries from the 1300s. Uh, one of the castles was begun in the 1200s, and uh, it, there was just evidence everywhere we looked. Well, I went back this uh, spring of last year. And of course, I've put this on videos and it's been on the web. <laughs> and of all the tapestries and all the areas in those two castles, that area that has the dinosaurs is now walled off and you can't go in and see it. Now, why? well, they're repairing it. Okay, but <laughs> it's that specific area only that they're walling off. I, you know, I don't know why, but I know what that looks like. I've had experience with that kind of thing. But you can't see it today. Now, the dinosaurs on Chateau de Chambord, you can't miss. Uh, they're all over the place. Year before last, we traveled to Cambodia, following evidence that had been forwarded to us by one of the tour guides there who had seen our website. And we had done some research and confirmed a good bit of what he was telling us. In the upper part of Cambodia, we see the ancient Khmer Empire had built just spectacular temples, maybe the largest and most beautiful in the world. And one of the greatest monument builders was Jayavardaman VII. He's almost idolized. This is a picture that I took there in Phnom Penh uh, of the Buddha-like pose. He began to rule in 1181 and built to prom and dedicated it in 1186. This was dedicated to his mother. It was a Buddhist monastery. And so we know who and when and all the specifics. Well, on the stone in this temple, a very beautiful, picturesque place, you see carvings, and they're stone carvings that cover just about every square inch of it. But just inside the front entrance in the corner here that the arrow points to, you can see a series of animals from the jungle. And notice in the series there is a perfect stegosaurus in a temple from over 800 years ago. And we're supposed to have known what dinosaurs looked like for about 150, and then they've been gone 65 million. I believe there's something wrong with that story. I don't want any comments about two fossils here, or two dinosaurs. <laughs> They're just one. <laughs> but it is more proof of the co-occurrence of humans and dinosaurs. Let's, let's think about some significance here of this acknowledged by the evolutionists before we conclude. Lewis Jacobs from SMU is president of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. 
one of the most representative, respected paleontologists in the country. And in his book, Quest for the African Dinosaur, he brings up the subject of the co-occurrence of men and dinosaurs. He said, such an association would dispel an earth with vast antiquity. The entire history of creation, including the day of rest, could be accommodated in the seven biblical days of the Genesis myth. This is, of course, his view of it. Evolution would be vanquished. Here's the implication, the significance, if you were to document this. And, of course, I think he's right. Now, there are conceivably some facts that could show that evolution was wrong. I've made a list of them. I mean, like all things, evolution is a provisional truth. There are some things that could convince me, at least, that it didn't happen. Now, that we don't have any of that evidence, but I just want to make a list to show you that we're aware that this theory could be falsified. Um, fossils in the wrong place. I mentioned humans in the Precambrian. But we haven't found them. We haven't found any of these, so despite a million chances for us to find out that evolution was wrong, we haven't found a single one. Evolution always comes up right. Where in the geological record have you ever seen a dinosaur and a human together? You never have. This is an empirical test. This young lady is shaking her head. Yes, you have seen a dinosaur and a human together? Good. Come see me later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, this would be a falsifiable test of evolution. If you could actually find a dinosaur or a trilobite or whatever and a, and a hominid uh, fossil in the same bed, that would do it. That would be a huge point against evolutionary theory. It has never been found. Now, when you look at these layers carefully, you find these beautiful fossils. And when I say beautiful, I am inspired by them. They're remarkable because we are looking at the past. You find down low, you'll find what you might consider as um, rudimentary sea animals. Up above, you'll find the famous trilobites. Above that, you might find some clams, some oysters. And above that, you'll find some mammals. You never, ever find a higher animal mixed in with a lower one. You never find a lower one trying to swim its way to the higher one. If it all happened in such an extraordinary short amount of time, if this water drained away just like that, wouldn't we expect to see some turbulence? And by the way, anyone here, really, if you can find one example of that, one example of that anywhere in the world, the scientists of the world challenge you. It, they would embrace you. You would be a hero. You would change the world if you could find one example of that anywhere. People have looked and looked and looked. They have not found a single one. We go back to the statement by Stephen Stanley that we referred to earlier, the topsy-turvy fossil man, and look at a fuller context of his quote. He said, there's an infinite variety of ways in which since 1859 the general concept of evolution might have been demolished. Consider the fossil record, little known resource in Darwin's day. The unequivocal discovery of a fossil population of horses in Precambrian rocks would disprove evolution. More generally, any topsy-turvy sequence of fossils would force us to rethink our theory, and yet not a single one has come to light. As Darwin recognized, a single geographic inconsistency would have nearly the same power of destruction. But these, these are his terms, destruction, destroy, disprove. That's the implication if you find humans and dinosaurs together, specifically. A single geographic inconsistency. <laughs> it's interesting to listen to what the evolutionists themselves say about what this would mean. Stanley says it would disprove evolution. Dawkins, referring to another find, says evolution would be utterly destroyed. And then Jacob says evolution would be vanquished. Now that's not my analysis. That's the leading evolutionist across the country. That's what they say such evidence means. If you've got a single geographic inconsistency, well, I believe we've shown more than a single geographic inconsistency. The Malachite man with the, the ten perfectly modern human skeletons in the same formation as Dinosaur National Monument, fossil footprints in Texas and New Mexico and Turkmenistan, three different places in Texas, the dinosaur petroglyphs, Peruvian Mexican dinosaur artifacts, the burial stones, the cat track and the hammer. And the, 
that's a whole lot more than a single geographic inconsistency, and I think the implication is just as they suggested, it demolishes. It is, the, the column itself is an, an abstraction that's put together based on the assumption of evolution, useful as a model that we can test against the real world, and when we do, we find it fails. It is contradicted. It's not proof. It is a demonstration of what ought to be that isn't. And let's conclude with a statement by Nova, who came to Glen Rose, looked at the same pictures that you looked at. The people that photographed it and interviewed us were excited. They thought they had some earth-shaking news and went back, and the editor wouldn't allow them to publish it. They did publish a brief presentation called God, Darwin, and the Dinosaurs, and mentioned dinosaur footprints side by side with humans. Finding them would counter evidence, they said, that humans evolved long after the dinosaurs became extinct, which is, of course, what's taught in the textbooks. It would counter that and back up the claim that all species, including man, were created at one time. Nova knows what that means. And therefore, they said in this blurb, there's nothing at Glen Rose that looks anything like a footprint a human footprint. Now, you can decide for yourself whether that's true. If there's something there that does look like, and we've shown that there are human footprints there and that that's the most reasonable conclusion, then this is what it means, according to the evolutionists themselves.